Welcome to Unbiased on the Fence. I'm Shane. Thank you guys so much for joining. We have Von Galt back with us. Let me get you in here and get you unmuted. How's it going, Von? Good. Hi, guys. <laughs> you enjoying your stay-at-home orders there up in the, let's see, you're in the Pacific Washington, Northwest. Yeah. Washington, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm here in, uh, you know, Seattle, Washington. Actually, I'm in the epicenter when it first started right. at Everett, the first quote, quote, case. Um, but you know, it's been interesting. It's been Groundhog's Day every day. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny how, like, when you mess your schedule up, it's so hard to keep up with the days. If I didn't have the shows on the certain days, I, I would mm -hmm. just be completely lost. Yeah, I wonder what that is. is it Monday? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and but you know what? I have started to get really uh, dressed up, you know, I'm wearing my prom outfits to go to the grocery store because it's a special occasion. <laughs> <laughs> my husband and I, we do rock, paper, scissors. Who gets to go to the store? <laughs> you know, you know, it's a big family excursion to go drive through. And I am doing QHHT sessions, but I'm adhering to the recommendations for my city ordinance. And I'm wearing these wonderful beautiful mask <laughs> so i'm playing the game of this reality and you know ha trying to have fun at the same time so while repping your um, team there <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's awesome so yeah i see uh, i see the young people really digging it they're like getting into the whole fashion of it and stuff so oh. everybody seems to be making the best of it so i, I think know? we're moving through just fine you know yeah, it'll, it'll get by faster the more we can make light of it and just kind of have fun. My daughter seems to think it's just like the funnest thing. She has a Frozen and a Minnie Mouse face mask that uh, a oh. lady made locally that we bought from. And I tell you, all these like el elderly ladies that are sewing are making a nice, handsome side income during this time. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing yeah this uh, i had a lady who i ordered um seahawks and supersonics masks from um from my best friend and her husband and some people uh further south of me and she was saying that she's making more money during retirement making these beautiful masks for people um than she did when she was working <laughs> so. that's funny because actually several people i've talked to now said that they were in the restaurant business they're actually making more money on unemployment than they were at work so it's like yeah and then making the masks to have fun with it and i tell you and then and the and she was saying that she gets so many orders for the children's mask um, you know, for the, the theme children's mask, Disney mask, et cetera, you know, Avengers, et cetera, that she's got back orders from the children's m mask more than she does the adult mask sometimes. And everybody wants to rush ship as soon as possible because the children cannot wait to get it because they want right. to play around with it. So it's been, it's been interesting. So the reality has some, um, some fun in it. Right. So. Well, I think here there's no city ordinance about having to wear a mask. It's just recommend it. And, um, and, you know, most businesses you go to, a lot of the workers aren't worried about it. They're not wearing any mask or anything. And so I'd say maybe a third of the people at the most at any one point you might see. It might be a third of the people there. But most of the time it's, you know, you might see one person with a mask, you know, around or whatever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's really not too crazy, you know. Quiet. Yeah, you know, it, yeah, it's been very quiet. You know, the thing is that it has has here in seattle the thing that the pandemic has done is actually i think i in, you know everybody has a different perspective of how they're going to ride the wave but i see a lot of positives um a lot of the hospitals have gone virtual mm -hmm. uh, it's brought down the cost of um medical because it's virtual um and they brought back quite a bit of retired um physicians 
um, who can who can consult with you straight from their home using Zoom or any other app that they have. So that's really helped them out a lot. Um, a lot of people are embracing work from home and they're learning and people are able to work life balance a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, traffic has just gone wonderful. There's hardly <laughs> any there's hardly any traffic accidents or road rage or anything else like that. Um, you know, and and for the most part, yeah, everybody's just doing their thing. Um, they're being more neighborly. Yeah. Keeping in contact with each other. Um, you know, just waving from a distance, having people's phone numbers. You know, it's just it's been really positive for the most part. Yeah, that you know, we're kinda you know, sheltering in, we still go out, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing against going out. People still go out. They go walk around the neighborhood. They go to the drive through more often than they would just to, to dine in. Right. A lot of the restaurants um, have moved into dining option. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of them scaled down operations to be just uh, for the most part um, delivery and, and, you know, delivery drivers have all been really good. So, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of positive um, outcomes out of this in my area and all the grocery stores for the most part, except for your, your huge warehouse suppliers, um, they're fully stocked and there's, you know, nobody's in shortage of anything. Right. Yeah. Like here, yeah. I think hand sanitizer and sanitizing products that, you know, like the wet wipe things and things like that are like a... Uh, Hard to get a hold of still, mm, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of because everybody, like, ran out at one time to disinfect everything. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was talking to somebody on Etsy, and she's like, I, you know, my husband moved away from making moonshine to making <laughs> hand sanitizers. <laughs> Probably a good thing. That's a good move, you know. If you've got the stuff to do it, you know, you might as well. <laughs> People were very candid with me, so so uh, it was really funny. I was like, hmm, I, you know, I might have to buy and test what bottle out of your um, your hand sanitizer. <laughs> so you know, because we carry some with our in our bags and so forth. But you know, th this has this has been go like uh, this has been going around. This bug, COVID nineteen, has been going around since the cold and flu season here in Seattle. Right. Um, in and December. a lot of last year no like um the seattle flu study reported cases of it out of i think over 1200 flu cases um and it was reported by our, our local news so many people in this area are familiar mm -hmm. with it but back in like november oh okay then november, it's the covid 19 it's the newer corona no that's why they call it covid 19 covid 2019 right. is when it showed up in 2019 it's not right. covid 20 right 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 so, uh, you know, you guys, you gotta stop and like think about the naming. Like, there's a reason why they named it what they named it. Oh yeah. Was when it came out. Um, so you know, we, we won't really know for sure until the antibody tests come out in a mass scale. Um, my husband and I are, are really open to the antibody test. We really want to find out if that funky flu was it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we'll see what happens. And just kind of played by ear after that. Right. So you guys yeah. think it might have already moved through your area. You might have already, you might already be immune to it already then. Huh? Yeah. That's, and most, most, most people, there isn't as many cases. I mean, most of the hospitals are very short um, or very light. There isn't very many cases. Now I didn't say that there is no cases. I know people who have gotten um, COVID and, they've had serious recovery issues with it and mm -hmm. they needed a ventilator, but in a scale, it's very, very small. Right. So you, it, you, you, you don't take it lightly. Mm -hmm. You know, if everybody up here in Seattle, um, you, I talked to my neighbors and they talk to their children, everybody, they have their, okay, if we caught it and we happen to have the unfortunate luck of not recovering easily, um, you know, we have our emergency plan. We know, our hair healthcare providers numbers. We know how we're going to do quarantine. We know how we're going to allocate taking care of the children, et cetera, et cetera. We know our FMLA in Washington state and emergency FMLA. Um, so, you know, we, everybody is very familiar and they pass information around. So a lot of people are very familiar that if they had the worst case scenario, they would be um, able to adapt and work with it. But for the most part, um, it's been very, very small cases. Mm -hmm. as and we've both to been actually, 
we've both been actually getting through our sessions that, you know, unless it's really part of your experience, you're not going to experience it. You're not going to, like, die from this if that wasn't part of your plan. So, you know, exactly. not to be in fear about it. If, if that does happen, then that's what you agreed on, and there's nothing to be fearful about. So either way, exactly. it's, it's just relax about it, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Like in, I mean, because in Washington, the nursing home that had many of them, that had bed, bed vent, ventilation, and mm-hmm. I have friends who have family members who were in that, um, and they survived. But um, – and the gentleman – who quote, quote, had the first case in Everett, Washington, in my city, he was in his 30s, he survived. Um, so many, many, many people survive. And as they're doing antibody tests, they're finding out a lot more people have had it in this area longer. And we don't really know how long they've had it and how many people have had it, how many people have, um, you know, recovered and thought it was just some funky flu bug that they had. So we don't really know. So, you know, until you get all the information out, it's best not to speculate or come to conclusion about anything until we know, you know, all the information. So I just play along with it um, in my QHHT sessions that I've, I've had two last week. And I, you know, am continuing to get some um, throughout the month as well during the pandemic. And I see more happening. What's happening is interesting is the ones I, cause I typically get star seeds and indigos. And the ones that I get, they, you know, will call... Uh, in their session wonder, you know, I was never interested in metaphysics before, I was never interested in parallel reality, sacred geometry, all this kind of um, stuff was never an interest to me. I just all of a sudden decided and woke up one day and it was an interest a week and a half ago or a week ago or two weeks ago. And it's a recurring thing. So something's going on with the Schumann frag- uh, resonance, I think it is. I don't yeah. know where it was last time, but more people are waking up and they are wanting to you know get some of this information and kind of move along their path but um in the sessions that i have the recurring thing that i get um when i talk to the subconscious and many of them ask about you know the current pandemic as one of their questions or they ask about you know um like what's the deal like that yeah. yeah 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 and the thing that continues to come back over and over again from the subconscious is um if it is meant to be your experience you will have that experience for your own personal growth mm-hmm. um it's just like somebody who has cancer no two people who gets cancer are going to recover the same exact way and mm-hmm. they're going to come out on the other side two different people mm-hmm. so um you were going to get your experience that you're supposed to get Um, At the same time, you do have human bodies. So just because you're not going to be, um, you know, maimed does not mean you go walk in front of a car. Right. (laughs) Okay. So um, you do have bodies and you should be um, respectful of the human bodies and the healthy bodies that you have. So, you know, take some respective precautions, uh, but don't go overboard. And then the other thing a lot, a lot of the subconscious say is, um, you know, the people who are going to, um, this is fatal for, it was part of their life plan. Mm-hmm. And they will have conversations if they want to. They can have conversations with that spirit and that soul on the other side in the sessions as well to clarify why or whatever the questions they have. But the other thing that the subconscious really wants people to know, and what I get in the sessions recently, is that um, people really need to take control of where they want their life to move forward to um and this is a pivot point in their life so um you know lay off the conspiracies because yes they do exist just like other horrible things happen in the world exist um but you don't spend too much time focusing and getting inundated on other horrific things that happen around the world but you're going to spend all that time on certain conspiracy theories and they may exist, but they don't really f- affect your personal sphere of influence that much. They didn't make you marry that person. They didn't make you take that job. They didn't make you have all those children, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So most of the things that happen in most people's lives mm-hmm. are their decisions of, of how they're going to walk this journey. And these other conspiracies, although um, 
they have some truth to them don't have that much power in many people's lives and 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 the subconscious continue to reinforce that you create your own reality and you manifest your next um, experience so um, focus on being the best version of you and less on uh, these other things that really have no bearing in your life yeah so. that's actually what came through in my sessions and it was like saying that they're important wake-up calls, but they're mm-hmm. stepping stones. So if you kind of get stuck in it, then it's it's sort of working backwards. I mean, because if you get stuck there, then it's like it's holding you back. You're, you're feeding it. You're putting energy in it, like you were saying before. So you're actually yeah. feeding into what you don't want. You know, exactly, so. exactly. It's just like the conversation we had about the analogy of the pothole. Right. So you're driving down the road of life. And there's this big sign that says, watch out for huge sinkhole ahead. Okay. <laughs> but you can still get around it. So we just got to take the detour and walk around it. But instead of taking a detour or slow, slowly jolt going around it and moving on to get to your next destination that you're working on getting to, you decide to stop and look at it and expect <laughs> that your car goes into the sinkhole. You're <laughs> stuck. You got to get road side assistance. You got to call everybody else in the whole world. And now you're stuck there. I mean, you put it on Facebook and on and on the story evolves. So that sinkhole was not really supposed to be part of your experience, but you just made it part of your experience. And that's really what um, spending all your time in, in these other concepts do to your life is they kind of derail you from the time and energy you're supposed to be spending on bettering your life and yourself but you know on the deeper level isn't it funny because you can look at that and you can see how you got stuck there because you needed to get stuck there in a way you needed to work through some stuff you know what i mean you needed to learn to like let go of that so even at those times like that you know it's like we're just learning you know yeah yeah the the first pothole maybe the 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 70s i mean there's this point where (laughs) I know people like that. They just can't stop. They just can't. They just can't drive by a car crash. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we can get caught in these cycles, and that's why we see stuff come up over and over and over again. You know, and I've had people tell me they were like, "How, did, how have you like progressed so fast through you know in this period of your life?" And it was like just realizing there's a lesson there and not being the victim. Because once yep. you realize it's a lesson, then you can learn what you need to learn and move on. But as soon as you get stuck in the whole victim thing, like, why does this keep happening? Why is this? You know, and then you're sort of in the, more of the victim. Why is this happening to me? That rather than what is this teaching me? What opportunity or experience mm-hmm. should I be learning from this? You know what I mean? It's yeah, like a it's shift just, in perspective. Exactly, exactly. And that's really what it all comes down to. It comes down to consciousness. You know, it comes down to your consciousness um, and the subconscious consciousness. And it comes down to, okay, what do you want to experience next? And based on what you want to experience next, where do you want to focus your intentions and your energy on? Um, because where your your energy and your actions and your intentions are focused on is where you're going to go next, what you're going to manifest into your next ex- best experience. So it's all about shifting your perspective, shifting yourself and your energy into something else that you would rather prefer. So mm-hmm. I had done an experiment during um, during this, this shelter at home. And um, I don't know about you, but I am having quite a bit of Mandela effects on a personal level. I actually started counting them. Oh, so really? I've had, yeah, I've had maybe, um, I think last time I, I counted, I think it was like 10 or 12 man, personal Mandela effects. And it's just about shifting uh, a perspective on um, on people. I just accepted, you know, some people, that's just what, hey, you want to do that? That's perf- totally fine. I accept it. No problem. Uh, it's not my responsibility to save you. You're going to learn on your own. I wish you the best. Move on. And the next day, it's a completely different parallel person. Yeah. That is responding. And I told my friends, and some of my friends have called me and said, Vaughn, I... I have parallel parents too. <laughs> I, and it's, it's a while. It's a while. So I'll give you some examples. So um, my best friend and I both worked with a coworker for many, many years. And this coworker works in a different shift than I do. One, very recently, um, this person messaged me on messenger to say hi because she just shifted to the same shift and i said oh i 
really, when did you start? And I got all this information and she gave me the exact start date and all this information. And I said, um, that's very interesting because remember so-and-so that we work with, she has record of your conversation of when you started this exact shift two years ago. Wow. And she's like, no. And so the parallel person is laughing at the evidence of her parallel self. Right. And then myself and my coworker are laughing at the evidence that we have of the parallel person. It's just phenomenally, it's just funny. It is. So, and, and, I, and, and something else, the same other things happen with another friend of mine who reached out to me and, and her parents are parallel parents because she says um, she grew up and she knows everything about her parents, um, you know, careers. And she knows every little trinket in the shadow box of her father. Um, well, her father is a, um, a re state representative in Idaho back in the day. And um, he, you know, she finally accepted her parents for their viewpoints, political viewpoints and everything else. Stopped trying to, to um, convince them otherwise and just said, you know what, you guys do what you do. Um, I'm, I'm moving on. Then all of a sudden she moved um, and visited them and her father showed her um, a shadow box that she has never seen in her life, ever. And she knows everything in that room and in that um, mantle. And it was um, a gift from a, um, a guard of, uh, of JFK when he was shot. Mm. One of the guards, um, end up going into a political career, but he worked with her father and gave him that gift. And um, she's, she was floored because that's not something you're never going to tell your, your children. Oh, right, right. For sure. Like, yeah. You know, like I'm best friends with the, one of the bodyguards um, during JFK's shooting. So right. it's, it's something, it, it's something that, you, how can you not ever tell that? Right. And so she was, and so she was just kind of floored by that. Um, and he said, that's always been in my office this whole time. I mean, I told you this before. And she's like, no, I would remember this. So another example of parallel parents and she just started laughing at it. Um, and then I, this is something, um, Jane, Jane Goodall, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, she's a conservationist with monkeys and, um, just ecosystem habitat. So she's running some um, some fundraiser. I don't know if it's this month or next month, but Jane Goodall. Well, we, many of my friends remember posting about her death about a year or so ago. And she's still alive. Jane Goodall's alive now, huh? Jane Goodall is alive and running and doing a fundraiser. I think she died since I woke up in 2017. It seems like uh -huh, I heard about her dying. Uh -huh. Because I didn't recognize the name sounded familiar at the time. So when the news came out about it, I'm like, who is that? And they're like, you haven't seen the movie about the monkeys or documentary uh -huh. or something? I was like, eh, maybe. And they're like, I, they use the clips everywhere. So you probably seen it and didn't realize it. And so, yeah, that's weird. That Yeah. Anybody else alive. remember her passing away in the last couple of years? Because I definitely remember that. Yes. That's why I know who she is, is because she. Yeah, away. yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I follow conservation. So, um, yeah, she's she's doing a fundraiser. It's a great fundraiser. If you're really into that, you know, definitely join up her fundraiser. But uh, in the other reality that I was in, she had passed away, and I and many of my friends had posted, a, you know, condolences about her life achievements. And so this is a parallel Jane Goodall. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually a perfect segue. So you've been taking advantage of this time at home. You got your book just about ready to release. Do you know have a date yet? Just next month or? Two? Oh, I'm. You know, it's it's interesting because um, you know everybody deals with pandemics differently, and writing is uh, my meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband has been making quite a bit of music during yep. um, during <laughs> this as well, but writing is my thing, and so I finally have the time to do it but i don't have as much time because now i watch my children 24 7 which is wonderful <laughs> right but it's groundhog's day every day and um it is definitely a challenge uh, you know to watch the kids as they're running around 
making a, a havoc of my office and <laughs> yep. taking my things as I'm doing work. They're taking my mouse because it it fits whatever game they're playing with. So it's been a it's been an interesting challenge when I break off and from work and write a little bit more into my book. But at this point, I am done with it. It is um, actually I have it in front of me. Yeah. Um, it is. There it is. So it's wow. a four, it's almost a four hundred page. My daughter drew all over it. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I find my cliff notes and I have drawings all over, and um, so I'm real. Um, well, it's nice to have a eleven illustrator for your book, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. My, yeah, right. My daughter will draw on my whiteboard that I use um, with QHHT clients and make a drawing for customers or for clients that come mm. in. And sometimes it is kind of ironic because the last one I had, she drew a bunch of vortexes and galaxies and stars um, and a person in a spaceship, and the person that came that came for the session um his three or four lifetimes was that he was a galaxy and traveling the vortexes and a space explorer wow. so it is really kind of it's really kind of funny yeah. uh i do shelter my children from a lot of stuff um just because there's interesting people out there so <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a nice way to say it um but um yeah, the book is almost 400 pages, and I am proofreading it. And really what I'm waiting on is I'm waiting for my um, book cover illustrator. She lives in Milan, Italy. Mm. And she has been um, lo in in a lockdown for a while. Everybody knows about Milan, Italy. And, you know, she was working on, on it here and there. And then, of course, uh, things happened in Milan with COVID. And so, um, you know, there's been some some personal um, trials and reflections with family members and other things happening in her city. So it's taken a little bit longer um, for us to complete the projects just because COVID life has happened. But um, Divine it, timing though, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, it is. And But the, the thing is that um, she is a wonderful gal and um, – she is doing my cover has Kuan Yin, which is the female um, Buddha, Kuan Yin, um, and she is in a mandala, and it's a lot of it's just it's just really beautiful illustration that she's doing for me. And when she's done with it, then we'll put it all together, and then we'll um, send you guys uh, maybe at the next show. Hopefully, it will be published, and then we can. Um, I can give the link and usually Amazon lets me Amazon lets me do five days promo where I give my book away for free. Oh, so wow. I always give my book away for free um, every year for five days. Um, and I, um, I spend my own money to promote and push it out on Facebook through the world mm -hmm. to help the world out. Um, and whoever gets it, gets it. Whoever reads it is supposed to read it. And, um, and then I just sit back and see what happens because uh, most of the time I don't like to be in the limelight and I don't really like to attract a lot of uh, attention. I just like to do the work and get it out there. <laughs> so, I completely get it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out, but, but this is a sneak preview of what's inside the book. And, um, and when the book comes out, you can read the 300 and 75 pages with all the scientific information and get yourself down the rabbit hole. Awesome. We're really looking forward to it. So let's dive in deep here. You've yes. got a PowerPoint for us? Yes. So do you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, I'm going to pull it up now. It's I'm going to make it the big window here. Let's see. Um, try to anyway. Let's see what this one does. Here. There we go. Okay. Okay. Okay, you're all set. All right. So, um, Buddhist mandalas explore parallel realities with sacred geometry. So that's the book title. Okay. So if you're not aware of, of this gent fine gentleman, this is Richard Buckminster Fuller. 
and he's the inventor of the icosahedron uh, dome structure that you're probably familiar with. Uh, it's very iconic. So mm -hmm. he has this wonderful saying um, that he said in many one of his lectures, which I took note of. Um, and I love watching the old reels of Bucky um, going over these lectures. So he says, you don't have to know anything to be negative. You have to know a great deal to be positive. All the great governments and all the great religions and all the great businesses would find it devastating to have man be a great success. They want suffering so you can rely on their leadership. I know we can change this, but it depends on the new young world. So Bucky doesn't really care about the adults. He's only caring about the kids of, of the now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is just so funny. So at his time, it was a lot of his concepts were kind of um, foreign and people speculated on kind of where his mindset was, but he was ahead of his time. And, um, and the children of now and the children of the near now is really what he is, um, you know, getting that message to. So some notations about Richard Buckminster Fuller. He had his spiritual awakening in his early 30s when he had no money and had stress of supporting a family. So he almost committed suicide and thank goodness that he didn't, um, you know, got over that. And then as soon as he got over his suicidalness, um, he had a moment of awareness where he basically had his um, first spiritual awakening. And so after that awakening, he started to develop the dome structure architecture from understanding the metaphysics science of sacred geometry that he designed based off Archangel Metatron's cube. So the geodesic dome behind you that you see there, that is sacred geometry. If you see those intersection points and you look closer at the image, you'll see the circles you start seeing the flower of life. Oh yeah, I can see it in there, amazing. So anybody look at the picture in close detail and instead of focusing on the triangles, intersecting triangles, look behind there and you'll start seeing the flower of life. Yeah, actually it's at the, the points of the triangles are, looks like the center of the circles. Okay. Mm -hmm. So keep inspecting that people. I'm gonna continue reading a little bit more about okay. um, Bucky's wonderful contribution um, to 5D. So the message that was mapped out in the form of conclusive math, which we know now as vortex math, but at his time, just math, is depicted in sacred geometry, which is an infinite unbreakable truth in nature, which is that everything exists in unity, harmony, and oneness. Okay, so all of nature in, exists in harmony and oneness and people are working to exist in nature in harmony, unity and oneness. And that's really the profound information that he discovered from studying sacred geometry and putting that into his architecture, which really stood him out um, in his time. And then in his latter years, um, after a successful career as a pioneering um, sacred geometry architect, he spent much of his time lecturing with the famous Indian yogic philosopher, Maharishi. So he might sound familiar to you. Maharishi um, did over 60 different studies on meditation and consciousness and how meditation changes reality. So we'll get into that a little bit later. But one of his peers was Maharishi. And in that time of the lectures, he uh, lectured to children of America to find enlightenment, enlightenment within in order to reinforce social responsibility and unity consciousness in creation of advanced technology that may bring an end to global human suffering. He encouraged adopting, again, good meditation and energy balancing practices like yoga to help the children of the future live in a higher frequency and move forward in physically, 
manifesting the next stage of the human experience in an energy of unity consciousness. Now, Buckminster Fuller, this is like in the in like the, the 50s and 60s, people. And you say that kind of stuff back in the 50s and 60s, and they're going, what are you smoking? <laughs> but for us now, we're like, yeah, you did it conscious us. We got that 5D, sure, no problem. You know, working with social responsibility in technology so that we don't destroy the, the earth and each other and live in harmony in how we create technology and use technology responsibly. I mean, those were things that he was talking about um, before technology became a thing. Okay, so he was really, really ahead of his time. And he was talking to, to us now, 50, 60 or so years ago. So um, again, everybody look at the dome one more time before you go to the, next, to the next slide. And you look past those triangles, you will see all the intersecting flower of life. So you had mentioned vortex math. I want to bring out that. So this would be right around the time of te Tesla then right Let's see, um, he died in the 40s or 50s i think of I, no i no he he i test i think and i'm correct me if i'm wrong but i think tesla died before um oh 43 Fuller. yeah yeah um but so he lived quite quite a long time buckminster and and did a lot of um university lecture circuits in his latter years. I mean, he was mostly interested. He'd already made his money. He made his career. He was just interested in talking to um, the youth. Mm. You know, very good work, though. That's, that's but, very detailed for the time. I mean, wow. Look at that. Yeah, I mean, who's talking about unity consciousness in the 60s? Right. <laughs> I found a lot of information <laughs> like that. Like like the whole St. Germain, uh, you know, I am discourse and stuff. I never seen that. And it's like you hear it and it's like it was from the 1930s or something. It's like I cannot believe they were talking about this back then. You know? Yeah, it's 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 trendy now and you know, we think we're like really cool cuz we're getting into it. These cats we're so had a late long to the party. Ago. We're so late to the party. We're like we like we're not the first wave. Right. <laughs> so they were the first wave. They pa they paved it. So, anyways, um, but really good stuff. So let's go to the next slide. Right. I love Bucky. He's my favorite. There we go. All right, a little <laughs> lag there. Okay, so what is sacred geometry? Okay, and again, everybody look at the picture because by the end of this, you're going to get really good at studying art history um, in Buddhist mandalas. And I did a little bit of a minor in art history, so um, this is all up my, up my angle. So what is sacred geometry? Do not follow the ideas of others, but learn to listen to the voice within. Your body and mind will become clear and you will realize the unity of all things. So that is from the Zen Buddhist master teacher, Dogen. And um, he actually calibrates really, really high in the scale of consciousness. Um, I think he was like a eight or so hundred, really high up there. Oh, but wow. That's way up there. all he ever did, um, all Do Dogen ever did was talk about the unity of all things. Everything is in sync. Everything um, is a manifestation of you. And the people who are highly conscious and highly spiritual, they get to a point where they don't, f they don't no longer belong to any organization. And so now it's like, okay, the challenge is how do you travel through different realities and manifest better and greater experiences for yourself when there are a few teachers left for you for you to um, study from. You have to start practicing what you know within yourself. So, you know, you get to that part of, of Zen and you get to that part in your level of consciousness and it's, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult because you don't have, um, you kind of just open up the yellow book and, and find a church that you can go to so and and this is where the challenge is and this is where you see other people who are doing it really can help you um craft your reality so this is what dogen is really really popular for is crafting the reality based on the universal one mind 
Um, so we're getting a little bit esoteric when we go into Buddhism, but mm -hmm. it will all make sense because it's all scientific. So the structure, so sacred geometry, what it is, is the structure of platonic solids that are the makeup of all physical beings, okay? All physical beings are made up of sacred geometry. And I will show you that. And every human being is an energy being made up of a mandala with a halo around the head and a halo around the body. So you're, the energy that comes and emits out of your head um, has a frequency, but the energy that is emitted out from within your heart has five times greater frequency than the energy out of your head. That's why there's two halos. Mm, okay? okay, so go ahead and again, inspect this mandala. Every mandala, Buddhist mandala, will have the same structure for all the different Buddhas in the different realms. Okay, I see. So, so just, yeah, so I'm going to keep on talking as you guys study this and get familiar with it. I'm kind of interested in the way that the two, the two halos overlapping, there's the one around the body and the one around the head, and they together kind of make a mandal bright. I don't know if you're going to get into that, but... Mm. That's, that's, just, that's actually in book two, Notable Symbols. Right. I had to stop the book after 400 pages. Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> even even the, the Buddha head looks like uh, uh, the Mandelbrot design. That's kind of interesting yep, that it's, yep, like it's embedded a, all in throughout here, that whole fractal pattern that you see repeating throughout nature. Nature's exactly. art, if you will. You know. Exactly. We're all Mandelbrots. We're just smaller versions of bigger versions. Yep, exactly. uh, <laughs> it's the fractal nature of our reality that comes through. It's a, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyways, the there's two halos and then a person's aura field has a level of energy that it emits so the higher the level of consciousness the higher the energy field of the person so two people mm -hmm. may look alike but their energy field is completely different mm. okay so don't be fooled by two people thinking that they're exactly alike because you can take them apart and put them in a certain room and you'll get a totally different experience one person will attract more people, will elevate more people, everybody will feel better, things will just, you know, start popping, conversations will never end, everybody's just very creative, and the other person, not so much. That's the field that um, affects other people. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I have, I have tested this out my whole life, because I was, I, I'm, my family was poor growing up, Section 8, you know, yada, 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 welfare, you know, mm -hmm. uh, food stamps, etc. And throughout my whole life, all my friends were same similar kind of situation, not very wealthy, and they all have grown up to be extremely um, successful in their careers. So, um, and everybody that I come across after talking to them and hanging out with them, not doing anything special, again, becomes more... Um, successful so i i think there it is attributed to the energy field and i've i've met other people who has even stronger energy fields and um it's amazing the connections that people around them make just by being in that circle so oftentimes people will go to a master teacher just to be close to their energy mm. just to get touched by their energy and just get that little zing mm. um so They've proven this in consciousness study that everyone has an energy field mm -hmm. and everyone's energy field is completely different. Right. And, and later on, we'll go over um, how to um, measure the energy field of different people. So the last thing is people experience different parallel realities using their sacred geometric mandala. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so let's again take a look at this picture and in this picture, what you have is you have a central Buddha, which is representative of the universal one mind. And then you have different dimensions. You have physical lower dimensions, you have higher dimensions in the clouds, etc. And they all have different master teachers in mm -hmm. those dimensions. And they also have students and um, practitioners that are following the, their instruction, learning for them as well. But once you reach a higher energy level, um, you will ha have these two halos 
one around the head and one around the body. Um, and some people actually can see people's aura fields and it, it, it is interesting. Like I went to the grocery store and some lady ran out from the back and said, I saw you from the front. You know? <laughs> I saw your rainbow. <laughs> I, <was like>, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to get my groceries. <laughs> so, but, um, but no, it is definitely, definitely true. So, um, look at this study this you're going to see a common theme and they all have the same thing so let's go to the next one and then again shane if you or anybody else in the chat has questions about the images or anything else like that um i'll be happy to answer them as we go along as well okay i'm keeping an eye on the chat so if you guys okay. chime in with caps or at unbiased and on the fence and i'll see your question so the next the next one um sacred geometry in earth's grids so um, this beautiful earth right there, and she has all her grids. And if you look at this, remember that picture of the, um, the dome architecture that Buckminster Fuller created? Mm -hmm. The same thing. Yeah, I can see it. Similarity. You see, for sure. Yeah, you, you see the grid, the light grid. You see um, the intersection points. And if you actually put the um, geometric patterns in there you'll see Metatron's cube as well so basically earth has a consciousness as well so she is also a living being and we know she's a living being because of the Schumann residence it is our scientific way to measure her raising her energy level into the fifth dimension okay mm -hmm. and um, earth is also made up of sacred geometry and she is completing her mandala to move into a parallel reality towards the fifth dimension. So she's moving along with the whole universe, which is ascending. So she's being pulled along too. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, she can't drag her leg much longer. So the universe is ascending, all the other planets, everything within the, the spectrum is ascending and so is earth. Mm -hmm. um, and so at whatever level you're at right now, whatever level you are at, you're going to be pulled along by the storm. You're going to be pulled along. <laughs> so, okay, so things will get much, much more polarizing to test your true resonance. Mm -hmm. and, and people will show you who they are when they're tested. So um, this is perfect timing with um, the COVID right now because many that's what I was thinking. That sounds like <laughs> what we're in right now. Yeah. <laughs> like if you didn't think, if you didn't, if you didn't think a lot of the political and economic and social upheavals in the last couple of years wasn't polarizing enough, you know, earth, like just being part of this experience and then agreeing to be part of this experience for whatever reason for your own personal growth i mean that's gonna kick it up a lot it's gonna oh, yeah. turn up the dial <laughs> yep. so much <laughs> so, and i've seen that too i've seen people who have been you know love and light and farting rainbows and confetti comes out of their <laughs> mouth all over the place and as soon as as soon as covid came around it's out the window and it's armageddon <laughs> <laughs> i've heard about it yeah and I'm like, well, what happened to consciousness? What happened to consciousness? <laughs> what happened to manifesting your own reality and taking, you know, your the own reins on your life? So right. you just play your game, do your thing. You'll get there. So anyways, things, you know, things are really going to amp up and they're going to amp up more. And as you go along, imagine it like this. Imagine like um, if you were ever in a storm. Okay, like a really bad thunderstorm or a hurricane or a tornado. Some people in the Midwest have gone through tornadoes. Okay, um, everybody's going to respond differently to that experience as they're getting pulled along. Okay, you're going to mm -hmm. have some people who are just going to get an easy time, just be like, ooh, I'm just going to go with it. Ooh, yay, you know. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have some people who's going to be cussing all the way. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have other people flying through, trying to hit everybody along, you know. So you have, everybody has a different experience with the storm that's pulling them through. Yeah. Um, but they'll get to the other side. And again, as you're going through difficult terrain, um, try your best not to do something that you're going to regret six months later. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, because, advice. yeah, because, uh, you know, Earth is going to, you know, kick it up quite a bit. And um, 
this is a series of things that's going to continue to raise your your resonance, continue to usher you, in, you into a newer way of living with her. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to get to a point where you experience a galactic Earth, you're going to have to really, really come to terms with um, stereotypes, prejudices, hang-ups, etc. Because if like somebody who is not of your human species walks right by you okay you, it's really going to challenge oh, um, yeah. <laughs> your humanity okay don't first don't you know so or like if if things change and your 3d world has completely changed and you have to learn new skills um it's going to really challenge your way to a, a adapt and you know live in the higher energy so we are all learning this together and everybody's going to go through it differently so um you know just be aware of that as as spaceship earth continues to rise with the universe so um and it's it's it's, it's she's lighting up so i'll, I'll explain the scientific behind that as well right. so in completing the light grid through connecting vortex points around the world signifies the completion of Metatron's cube for planet Earth. So some people will make it, others won't. No judgment, it's just how energy organizes. So remember, there are parallel versions of most most people, mm -hmm. okay? And um, remember that you're experiencing something because it was meant for you to experience in your soul growth, in your life experience for some, some reason. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's not a matter of judgment. If you go into a physics class and you study physics or you study science at all in chemistry class, you'll learn that, you know, things condense matter matches up to other matter, light, attracts other light, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the same exact thing. It's just simple physics and just how energy organizes. So mm -hmm. higher frequency goes of higher frequency, lower frequency can't stand you and they move on. So it's just different experiences and that's okay too. Mm -hmm. Eventually everybody will make it. So, um, and then um, people who radiate at 5D unity consciousness will have an easier time living in spaceship earth. All others will struggle hard to keep up with the new higher level curriculum. So, um, just, you know, just take the example of we're, we're all going through the storm of COVID right now, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't take long to go to Facebook and kind of see where people are in their their, you know, their <laughs> yeah. psyche. So, um, you know, the people who it's getting too hot in the kitchen for them, they're going to move on. So well, I, I love the fact that you called it curriculum because it's. You know, when you look at this like a classroom or, uh, you know, that we're all here to learn something and it's like a university where we all have our different classes and our, our own journeys and gifts and things like that. You can really see how we're all here to learn something. Nobody's mm -hmm. better than anybody. If if we graduate out of one section of the university of life and move on to something else and somebody comes later on, it doesn't make us any better because we're all here doing our own thing, you know? Yeah, we're all, inf we're all infinite. You're mm -hmm. all infinite. There's really no end. It's just the, the end of one experience or another experience. And, and you're going to experience, I mean, everybody experiences, uh, you know, the wave differently. Mm -hmm. So um, if you want to experience it more cohesion, then there are ways to do that. If you want to experience it with more difficulty, because that's just kind of how you like to ride the wave, then <laughs> you're going to get that. Right. So, um, so Earth is also um, lighting up. And the thing that's, that's interesting We'll go on to how she lights up her light grid. Mm. Sacred space and ley lines. Yeah. Sacred space and ley lines. So the interesting, okay, so the interest, everybody is very familiar with Stonehenge. Yeah. Um, Stonehenge has, there's been so much scientific evidence around Stonehenge having a very, very high energy field around it. Okay. And the thing that's interesting about Stonehenge, it kind of really brings a lot of scientific scientific information to sacred space and ley lines is that Sir Alfred Watkins in England discovered ley lines in 1921 through dowsing rods and mapping out the magnetic lines on the earth. And so he found that sacred G megalithic monuments often resided along these energy grid paths on the earth 
and that the access points along the sacred pathways often had large abundance of energy like a vortex okay so in his research and you could do this with dowsing rods like actually um all the power a lot of the power power um, companies when they try to find new places to um, set up they take out a dowsing rod and they walk around trying to find where the water is and that's how these energy companies find where they want to set set up their plants they mm-hmm. use dowsing rods they, they locate where is the highest energy in the land so um so what so what that means is if you look i'm going to go back to the other slide at sacred geometry and earth's grid all these points are high energy markers Mm -hmm. okay so all the high energy markers the intersection points is where these little vortexes or high energy grids are and oftentimes what they found and what sir Watkins found is megalithic architectures there um, ancient temples churches pyramids lots of pyramids are on these um grids and oftentimes easter island that Easter island, island. In the middle of nowhere, yeah. <laughs> yep, all over the world. Yeah. Bermuda Triangle, all of these weird earth events that happen around electricity often are in these vortexes. And what they also found, Sir Alfred Watkins also found, is um, he found that cities that are highly populated also gravitate and build on top of these high energy points so um and like washington dc like washington dc yeah Yeah. so people are attracted to the city they're attracted to for whatever reason Mm -hmm. not knowing but um like many of these big cities have um have high energy points on the earth's grid Mm -hmm. and so if you want to help the earth's grid light up even more you create all these um architecture to kind of help amplify the point so that's why pyramids typically are in all these grid points late um stonehenge and other megalithic structures like stonehenge are in these grid points Mm -hmm. So they're just lighting up and working on the natural energy of Earth's access points. So so there are all these vortexes all over the world that are connecting the the other vortexes and activating the light grids of Earth. Mm -hmm. And they've already found this in science. Like, 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 like if, if, you know, the universe is quite smart. It's not an accident that they're equal proportion to one another all over the Earth. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, these access points on um, these ley lines. Yeah, and they all so, line up and stuff. It's like, wow, it's amazing. On a global scale, you can see how they all line up across the Yeah, so remember that stuff. picture, that first picture of Buckminster Fuller's dome? Right. Imagine that's the earth and that's all the ley lines and the access points. They all start creating a flower of life. Right. Now, I don't so, want to get ahead of on your slide, but are you going to get into how we're sort of like that on the planet, creating the grid? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Okay. I'm build up. I'm build up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, anyways, um, so... And then, of course, in forests, in forests, and in nature, there are vortexes that can also be also be seen. You can see natural shapes and bends in the forest and the land mm-hmm. that kind of naturally build circles. And those are natural vortexes as well that they have in the forest. And oftentimes, if you go there, you'll see some kind of stone arrangement in that area as well. So, you know, in Sedona, the- have you been to Sedona? Yes. Okay, so you've seen the trees that sort of twist and grow up in the vortex areas, and the tree twists because of it. You can see the wood mm-hmm. spiraling around. So, yeah, that's neat. Yeah, I love Sedona. I cannot ever take a picture of Sedona without some random, like, rainbow color shape or my pictures or whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's you can't a, take a normal picture in Sedona. <laughs> yeah, that's a high energy place for sure right there. Yeah, Definitely the whole the place. Grid. Yeah. So definitely on the grid. So yeah. if you want to have some fun with vortexes and energies and grid points, go to where there are ley lines. Mm-hmm. Just go to a monolith mm-hmm. or a pyramid or you know some kind of sacred space. You'll yeah. have some fun pictures. Even so Mount anyways, Shasta, that's out towards you. I guess that that's like one of those. That's the mountain that's in, on one of the energy places too, right? You mean which mountain? Mount Shasta. Is that Mount in color? Shasta? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mount Shasta. Yeah. Mount Rainier too. Oh Mount yeah, Rainier that's too. that's even closer to you, isn't it? Yeah, not in here. Yeah. Um, so, 
again, human consciousness connects high frequency of Earth's ascension into 5D. So um, we all can connect to these energies as well um, through living a higher vibration and through meditation. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a Seattle girl, so I got to give some props to my city. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyways, um, this is the Seattle Ley Line Project. The, the, the Leyland map, map is, a, is a geo group project. And they actually, um, the gentleman on top right is Chuck Petty's. And he studied um, under Buckminster Fuller. So, of course, I had to ask him all these questions uh, when I went to visit his Earth Sanctuary. And he was part of um, the geo group project. And what they did was they mapped out the access points and ley line points in and around Seattle. And then what they did was put monolithic structures and art, like what you see here, all over Seattle. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so I actually work in a building really close to the Seahawks Stadium. There's a huge one that's like a floor and a half tall, and then there's Tesla sculptures at like a floor and a half tall. Uh, there's there's a point to it and the point is that um they they like power plants the power plants when they did dowsing rods to find the Leland areas and high magnetic points around seattle did that as well and that's how they found this is where we're going to put seattle city light this is where we're going to put the power plant because it magnifies the energy so they spend less money in creating mm. um, the energy because they're working off of the energy of the earth. Yeah. So, um, so really, really smart thing. And you could do this in your city. And if everybody in every city planner um, does a little bit of this in their sculpture, in their art, in their city planning, um, you pretty much can create all these cities that are high frequency and working off the natural ley lines of the earth. Um, and helping the light grid yeah. move up. Um, and also at the same time, because you do that, you help um, bring up the energy of the area and it attracts higher frequency individuals. So, oh. um, yeah, so um, you could do this in Oklahoma, you can do this in Kentucky, you can do this in New York, you can do this all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's really not that hard to do. So take a dowsing rod, go do some exercise, find the <laughs> points, stick a megalithic structure on it, move on to the next one. Really not that hard. So, um, but there's the sites there. And what he did after his city planning days, um, Chuck Petty's, he was one of the, uh, he, again, um, in this project, set it up with his group in Seattle and then connected Portland to San Francisco. So the whole West Coast has a unique frequency um, which can be duplicated all over the world um, using ley lines and the Earth's axis. Very so good. the whole West Coast has its own signature and frequency. Um, and again, other places in the world does this as well. As well. Um, a lot of the ancient pyramid sites um, have huge energy that people um, can go and see and learn about as well. So anyways, um, there's Chuck and I, and on the bottom right is me, we, you know, this is a 72 acre sanctuary in Whidbey Island, Washington, which is not far um, from where I live, maybe about a 15 minute uh, ferry ride. And of course there's my husband, um, the best cracker in the barrel. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but anyways, we always have, you know, a good walk there. So it's, it's a very good park to just kind of go into. Um, and again, you can uh, create that and duplicate that anywhere in the world. So Vesica Pisces, this is going to start looking very familiar because we're going to break down sacred geometry. You're going to break down the flower of life. And then we're going to put the parts back together. And yeah, you're going okay. you're gonna to see how it all comes back together. And everybody's talking about the same thing. Um, and it goes back to more than 13,000 years ago. This information goes back to Lemuria awesome. and possibly Atlantis. So Vesica Pisces, um, as you see on the left there, you see the Kofrit 
Christ at the Cluny Museum, it's at the National Museum of the Middle Ages in Europe. Um, as you see there, you see Jesus, and you see kind of like the Jesus fish is what he's known for there. Yeah. Um, but that Jesus fish is a Vesica Pisces. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and on the top right there, you see this is a real picture from Hubble. Okay. The NASA's Space Telescope. And it is the CY or oh, MYCN 18 Hourglass Nebula around a dying star. And so when a star dies, the way a star dies is it collides with another spiral galaxy and two spiral galaxies colliding make a vesica pisces and in the very center looks like an eye it does look like an eye a matter of fact that's exactly how my logo is i've got the jesus fish at the top with the eye in it like that from the two they call that almond shape the mandorla for almond but it's the two parts of the uh the circle that you know the vesica yep. pisces the it happens in nature. You do it over and over again. It happens in nature. There's always an eye in the middle of Vesica Pisces because the eye is when you take two intersections, mm -hmm. in Vesica Pisces in the middle, it is the portal right. to a new experience. Right. Okay. Which is why we see so, Jesus and Mary in the Mandorla so much in the artwork, right? They mm -hmm, are the doorway or the portal. Yep, yep. Right, because right. you have uh, the, remember the mandala where everybody has everybody who is of higher frequency has two halos one around the head one around the body mm -hmm. so jesus has one around him and then when he intersects with with mary it's basically two circles intersecting like a vesica pisces and right. the new experience right is maybe new people right <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyways as you see on the bottom right there is new people being created through the vesica pisces awesome. so um again some notations about the vesica pisces is the vesica pisces is an eclipse intersection of two intersecting circles mm -hmm. and again they're portals to new experiences um in buddhism it is believed that portals into a new reality are created within a person's consciousness through inner work. So you create a Vesica Pisces through your consciousness that propel mm. you to different realities. Um, and again, to do that is through changing your perspective and working on your inner work. Um, so there's no right or wrong way to travel and explore different realities. It's just based on where do you want, where do you want to go next? So, and, and again, um, a nice notation is that Professor Charles R. Henry at the Department of Sculpture at Virginia Commonwealth University wrote this in his um, article, Sacred Geometry, Linking the Human Form to Great Pyramids. Um, and in his life of work, he studied the P Great Pyramids of Egypt and the mathematics and found that they have the same proportion as the human body in terms of sacred geometry. So he mm. found that even the pyramids are designed much like sacred geometry as people are. And so what Charles Henry discovered is that when you take two bubbles and you merge them together in a, in a photograph and you repeat that pattern over and over and over again digitally, um, you'll discover that the intersecting spheres over each other form a human being and it starts to form like a face and a body and so forth. So he did that with, um, in his research, he did that with just digital just taking two two circles and just kind of compounding it over and over and over again, like the flower of life. Mm -hmm. And as it did that, a face started to form in his digital drawing, a body started to form. Wow. This is all digital. So it's the same thing as you see in the picture of the bottom right here. This is actual um, human cells. Mm -hmm. And if you look inside each one of those, those, um, those bubbles there, you may see one circle. You may see two in a bubble. You may see three. The one that's highlighted in the middle, you see four. Mm -hmm. Okay. It starts looking like the scene of life. Okay. Yeah. But as you make more and more, the ones behind there have even more than four. And so they start colliding and making these vesica Pisces. And as they collide more and more, they form a human being. And that's how you make a baby, people. 
<laughs> and that's about as deep as we're going to go with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. I do have a question from, uh, from Creative Goddess. She says, um, what is the benefit to going to one of these parks with the ley lines? Do we feel a surge of energy from going there? I definitely go to places like that for meditation. I feel like it amplifies it. What do you say, Yvonne? Oh, when I was in, um, when I was visiting Sedona, I really felt, um, I felt more clarity and I felt much better. Now, I don't really feel bad in the first place, mm -hmm. but I just felt like a zing of energy. I was, I had much more energy. Um, so a lot of people say that when they go to these um, grid points, they do feel better. They feel more healing and their meditation becomes more lucid. Yeah. Yeah, See, and and I know Sedona for me, it was like I could feel the energy there, but it was almost like you had to put your attention on it to see just how much stronger and different the energy feels. And once right. you like got into a meditative state and you you could feel you were in a different place, you can actually feel the energy, but you have mm -hmm. to put your attention on it. It's like you can totally miss it. So I could totally see a 3D person going there and be like, what are you talking about the energy? You know, it's sort of you have to tune into it. You got to tune yeah. up. You got to raise your vibration. And, right. you know, it, 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 it's. It, it is scientific uh, because they've already proven in science that these access points um, are Earth's natural vortexes, natural mm -hmm. um, energy points. Um, but a lot of the um, ancient churches are built on top of other churches that are built on these grid points. Mm -hmm. Right. So th there's no coincidence. They did that on purpose because mm -hmm. that is where the energy was. Yeah, and a lot of these so, structures will actually have the domed roofs too, because that's supposed mm. to funnel the energy or a, a tra or a, a py pyramidal uh, shape or whatever to funnel those yeah. energies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They put a lot of money and investment into trying to come up with sacred geometry architecture mm -hmm. to further amplify the energy that exists in that point right. on the ley line. So um, all very scientific stuff that, you know, they were not stupid when they spent all this time and energy creating all these cathedrals everywhere and these pyramids and megaliths. Right. So um, what you see here on the screen, the flower of life. So everybody's familiar with the flower of life. Um, mm -hmm. On the top left, there is the basic flower of life. Again, it's all those vesica Pisces that continue to form over and over and over each other. And as you can remember, um, Buckminster Fuller's dome architecture mm -hmm. is the flower of life in 3D, in the actual architecture. But um, what you will see, if you look to the right, is the egg of life. And if you remember the image in the previous slide of human cells replicating to build yeah. a human, out of multiple vesica Pisces that turn into a flower of life, that's the egg of life. So remember the I was saying those um, those little bubbles inside of a um, human cell, mm -hmm. they just start coming close to each other like the fruit of life mm -hmm. on the bottom there. They start coming together. Then they run out of space and they start colliding like the egg of life. Yeah. And they run out of space and because they keep multiplying and then they start turning into the flower of life. And mm -hmm. as you see there, Metatron's cube is encoded in the flower of life so this is a basic 3d portrayal like if you're looking at um all the vesica pisces that are duplicating and you just look at it from just from the top view it's right. going to look like the flower of life right. i'm going to show you it's actually a 3d structure um but on the right there you see the kabbalistic tree of life mm -hmm. and that's the kabbalah's um sacred form a uh, sacred holy form that falls into the flower of life okay so okay. you're going to start seeing that a lot of religious sacred geometry symbols are the same thing mm -hmm. so some things to notate about this um as you guys all study this to see the similarity you, and as you see this you're going to start you know really understanding it because it's going to like oh it falls into one it falls into another okay i get it um so there is a sophisticated math formula that is encoded within a three-dimensional structure of sacred geometry, which consists of 64 points, okay? 64 okay. points. In the flower of life, if you count all of those intersection points of Vesica Pisces, there's 64 points, okay? Just remember the number 64 because it's going to come up again okay. in other spiritual uh, symbols around the world. So the flower of life symbol um is seen in the artwork on the assyrian temple 
in um, Abydos, Egypt, in King Harold's palace in the first century, um, in the Flower of Life energy ball that two lions um, who often adorn the gates out of the Forbidden City in Beijing. They are also lions that are holding the Flower of Life um, in Asia and China, and in the Hampi Indian Temple, and of course the Library of Celsius in Turkey. So um, the Flower of Life has been around many ancient civilizations across the world. Um, in Again, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, not Leonardo DiCaprio, Leonardo da Vinci, the Freemason, drew the flower of life in his drawings as well. So, um, and I will show you that in the next slide, but one thing to notate as well about this image, if you start studying this image, you're gonna start seeing the scientifics behind it. So quantum physicist, Nassim Haramim, discovered that the intersection points in the flower of life pattern has 64 Vesica Pisces points, like I told you here, um, which is the same exact intersecting points as the Hindu Sri Yanta symbol, which is awakened consciousness has the potential to activate a wormhole vortex within their body. So the physicist has discovered that unlimited energy is created by people um, when they are awakened, when they radiate a high energy, and um, they create kind of a vortex vacuum inside their body, and that's how they move from one parallel reality to another, according to Buddhists. Because Buddhists have believed for over almost 2,600 years that you activating your mandala allows you to travel parallel realities. And the challenge, again, is to be a co-creator or a conscious creator. So there's no wrong way to travel realities. Some people just like a more smooth experience. So, and then again, vortex mathematics formulates that shapes such as the flower of life, seed of life, tree of life, the golden spiral, the golden ratio, tetra tetrahedron, hexahedron, oct octahedron, and the dodecahedron fit within the fifth element, which is Archangel Metatron's icosahedron cube. So that's why many people refer to Metatron's cube as 5D because it takes five platonic solids to fit in and make one dome. That's why it's 5D. Okay, I that's gotcha. what it means. That. So let's go to the next one. So the flower of life changes DNA. So we're gonna be like, how has the flower of life changed my DNA? Because I want to be healthier, look better, etc. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, in Buddhism. Um, the language and the words that people choose to say to themselves has an energy signature and that the, and that energy is a feedback loop that calibrates your personal health. So therefore, um, reassuring yourself that you are loved and that you're lovable, it does generate a healthy body. Okay. Um, so Metatron's icosahedron cube it shows up in language through the study, study of phonetic languages such as Celtic runes. Um, you can look at Celtic runes and you can actually take the shape of different runes and actually find it in the flower life pattern. Um, and when somebody studies Celtic runes they, and they take a, looker, a, a closer look at the flower of life symbol, they can easily see those different patterns. And then the other thing I remember, I told you guys, remember the number 64? There is 64 codons in DNA, uh, which are the same 64 Vesica Pisces intersecting nodes in the Sri Lantra and in the Flower of the Life. So the words that somebody says and hears sends a frequency that changes your DNA. So you, you, can, you probably already know this, but it's always good to kind of remember that if you talk shit to yourself every day and mm. you talk like that to people that you love every single day you are hurting them and you're making them sicker and you're making yourself sicker so instead of you know like if, if i always say if people put blades in the words that they choose to say they wouldn't say so many mean things to themselves uh. or to other people because they can physically see the knives cutting into people Right. Knocking them down. And the studies 
have shown that the language that you choose to use changes your DNA. Mm. So if you're sick or you're recovering from an illness, um, you want to sur- surround yourself around positivity, be positive on yourself. That's why like if you have cancer, you, you, you have to cut off all the negativity in your life, negative people, et cetera, because it doesn't help you in your recovery. It's the same exact thing. So they found this in science. Um, Doctor Russian doctors Peter Gar Gar Jahev and Vladimir Poponin said that positive words and affirmations to light rays, and then they took those f- positive affirmations and they shined that light ray um, with program affirmations and chants to the test subjects to different clients, and the result was that the client suffered from an illness they healed faster from the symptoms. Um, What they also did in their study is they intercepted the light language um, through ultraviolet light between two frog embryos in the lab. So they just, you know, they were watching two frog embryos and they just took snapshots of the light um, in in their lab. And they have the concept that there must be language between these embryos through light because they obviously can't talk. And they took those flashes of light that they picked up between these embryos and they shined it on a salamander embryo. And what resulted was a salamander egg developed into a frog. Okay. So they've already shown that um, light has language. So those solar flares have language. They have DNA codes. So we really do get these downloads like people talk about in a very scientific way. <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah. But wear your sunscreen. Don't get burned. Um, <laughs> remember, you still have bodies. So. But the, yeah, the, those, all that light that's coming from the sun, that's coming from the earth, all that light, it does have language. And it does um, send a frequency that those frequencies, what changes um, your DNA. So they've shown this in science. Okay, so Metatron's cube. Um, so according to Wikipedia, you know, they refer to sacred geometry commonly as Metatron's cube because it's been around for a long time, but Metatron really kind of brought it to the forefront um, in the Bible. And so it's just, it's just kind of been revered as Metatron's cube, but it's, you'll see that it's, um, Sacred geometry has been around all over the world for a very, very long time prior to the modern religions. Um, But basically, according to Wikipedia, Metatron is an archangel in Judeo-Islamic mythology. And he's mentioned in a free brief passages of the Agada and in the mystical Kabbalistic texts within the rabbinic literature. So the name Metatron is not mentioned in the Torah and how the name is originated is a matter of debate. But in Islamic tradition, he is known as Mitatrash, I think it is, and the angel of the veil. So that he's the angel of the veil. So he's gonna show you what's behind the secret curtain of this hologram. So that's what he was known for in Islam tradition. Um, in Jewish Ak- Apocrypha and in the early Kabbalah um, text, Metatron is the name that Enoch received after his, after his transformation into an angel. So furthermore, the Makaba text, Re, I'm going to botch this, Re Yugota Yehi Zeal identifies the ancient um, of days from the book of Daniel as Metatron. So there's all these different um, Abrahamic religions that have reference to Metatron as a person. And so regardless of the the debates in religious canon amongst um, the various sources of Metatron's life, um, sacred geometry is what is associated with Metatron. And Metatron's cube is due to the depictions of his um, accounts and his accounts of being communicated to with heaven through sacred geometry symbols. So let's um, may explain that a little bit more. And, and I know there's people who know the Bible up and down. I'm not professing to, to do, go that far. But this is basically how 
sigma geometry typically gets associated with Medtrans cube. So we refer to it as Medtrans cube, just to be simplified. But if you see it on the top left, you and I, I hope everybody's studying these images um, as we go along, because you know it's still going to start really making clear. Um, but if you see at the top left, you see Metatron there, and he's praying to um, and having communication with this higher being that's traveling in a circle, in a circle bubble. Okay, you see that? Memorize that because you're going to see that come up later on in Buddhist mandalas, a teacher in a huge circle. And then, um, of course, you have the lions there, the flying lions, the lions at the gates. Um, they're usually holding the flower of life. And then you have a wheel within wheels on the left there. And, um, and this is their version of wheel within wheels. But if you look at uh, the flower of life and you have Vesica Pisces that are circles of uh, wheels going within wheels, <laughs> you start getting wheels within wheels inside a bubble, okay? But that's the depiction um, of Matthias Marion's engraving of Ezekiel's vision from 1670. And then on the right of that picture, Ezekiel's wheel in St. John the Baptist Church in North Macedonia, and this is from the 19th century, this is their version of what he was talking about. Um, you see the Vesica Pisces moving around in a spiral pattern, kind of like a vortex, and they're interlooping each other. So again, you're seeing the Vesica Pisces over and over again, and the more Vesica Pisces that happen, they become the flower of life, right. that fall within a wheel. So you, you, know, you guys are starting to see how they tried to understand sacred geometry way back then, and this is kind of how they, how they um, were able to decipher what they were talking about. But this is hard stuff for even people like today to get. So, oh, yeah. but I mean, a lot of the people in the, the community that realized the Mandela effect was happening realized the the Vesica Pisces is a really good uh, symbol to show two realities sort of overlapping, and, and we'll have dual memories, and it's like you're in that center point of the overlapping, you know, the eyeball shape, the Jesus fish, and you're seeing a little piece of two different realities. So, yeah, right. it comes up all the time. It's amazing. It all the time. So this is really good kind of like symbolism, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, it, it's really hard to explain it nowadays. And, again, I spent 20 years studying this stuff to try to find scientific evidence right. on the understanding that I already knew growing up mm -hmm. from um, – mysticism in um in studying buddhism in my child childhood but it the information didn't become available until the span of the last 20 years right. so um we're really lucky to have all these people add the little piece of the puzzle and then me being a book nerd um took it on mm. and put it together so anyways on the bottom right there you have the Il islamic portrayal of metatron um, from the 14th century. So this is what he's supposed to look like. And all he ever talks about is him. They, they have him as an archangel in that mm -hmm. picture. Um, you know, is sacred geometry and moving parallel realities. So on the right here, what you'll see is on the left is the traditional 2D symbol of Metatron's cube. But these, like the tetrahedron, the hexadron, hexadron, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the last one, the icosahedron, those are the five platonic, platonic solids in math. Okay, these are real platonic solids. Um, and if you take them all and you put them into the icosahedron, they all fit. Okay, um, for those math geeks out there who's like, well, you know, the, the decahedron kind of looks like the icosahedron. So the decahedron fits within the icosahedron, but you can't fit an icosahedron into the decahedron. And right. that's just for those like platonic solid nerds. Okay. So, because that's just always some debate. You're like, I know more. Um, so, but anyways, if you put all of those together, all those platonic solids together, they make Metatron's cube. Okay, so that explains that symbolism. It's the same stuff. Um, and then another interesting notation um, in my book is like in 1960, uh, Kenneth Snelden or Snelson, uh, while trying to extend planar structure, he discovered a tension and a compression form to woven um, fabric and it is composed of struts and 
followed by a zigzag course and the rigid parts that held firmly in the tension wires. And so he actually published this in um, an article called Tensegrity and Weaving in the Binary World. And basically, in short, what Kenneth Snowden did um, is, you know, he works with fabrics and um, metals. And what he did was weave fabric based on the form of sacred geometry. And when he weaves fabrics based on the form of sacred geometry, once he tightened it up, the fabric changed to steel. What? Like, like the fabric what? pattern of thread, once he completed the flower of life pattern correctly, it changed to steel and then it turned back. It's crazy. That's how strong um, Metatron's cube is. Okay, so for you people who like to do that, go have fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in the previous in the previous slide earlier, I was talking about the the ancient structures that had the flower of life symbol. Mm -hmm. So, um, so on the right here, um, you have from four thousand to thirty six hundred years ago in the Middle Kingdom, you have the Temple of Osiris. And you have um, actually physicist Nassim Haramim um, actually went and saw this himself. Um, but he is a very interesting, it's, it's a close up picture of a very interesting megalithic site um, in Egypt. And nobody really knows what it was used for or how it was created. A lot of the, a lot of the stone was very advanced um, stonery. And as you go into deeper, like older and older, um, structures, um, it becomes more of a mystery of how they create it because it's so precise and so clean that even even the modern tools that we have today can't even duplicate it. Um, and so the interesting thing about the Temple of Osiris is that the flower of life pattern is not etch, it was burned into that, almost like an afterthought, like, uh, we're going to uh, forget about this sacred site, but let's just burn this pattern in and then run away. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. I don't know, people speculate, but it was burned into that. And that's what Nassim found. Um, and he's actually doing a lot of archaeology to uncover the flower of life all over ancient structures all over the world. Um, uh, at the Iraq palace um, at 645 BC, a lot of Islamic architecture also has the flower of life pattern all over the very common pattern um again here's a picture of the um codex atlanticus from 1478 to 1519 bce from the famous leonardo da vinci and he has a whole plate of flower of life balls so um you know he was already keen in on the secret too and mm -hmm. then in the middle you have from the first century a bathhouse image and these are all copyright free images. There's better images out there on the internet, but these are copyright free images from Wikipedia. So, um, but you have the Imperial uh, Garden Lion at the gates of um, the Forbidden City in Beijing, and that's from 1406. And what you'll see in a lot of ancient temples, and you'll see in a lot of Greek ancient temples and other Middle Eastern ancient temples, is you're often going to see the lion at the gates. Um, and the lions often hold a ball. And many of the balls, the pattern has kind of weathered out. But um, at the Forbidden City, it hasn't weathered out. And if you look closely, that's the Flower of Life pattern. It looks like um, that first slide of uh, Bucky Fuller's dome structure. Yeah, that's okay. what I was thinking. Yep. So, so, and it's interesting as they look into archaeology and they look into archaeology um, in ancient, ancient times that they don't really have any history for or account for. And they come across even some underwater archaeology, they come across the lion structure. It's always holding a ball in his paw. So this has been around longer than we know. <laughs> Just right in plain sight. And we're like, in oh. plain sight, but we have no clue what it means. <laughs> yeah, nice design. I think this I've seen it nice somewhere design. before. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. And remember, most of the structures, the ancient structures that archaeologists are finding underwater were before the Ice Age melt. 
like over 10 to 13 or so thousand years ago, right. um, according to geologists. And so some of them have this lion with holding this ball in their ancient temples underwater. Mm -hmm. So right. that tells you how old the symbol has been around. Um, and then, of course, in the, the left, you have um, diseases. So if you look at diseases and you actually look at them for the structure and what scientists and researchers have found is that diseases actually fall into sacred geometry patterns. Mm -hmm, sacred geometry patterns. And then if you look inside the diseases, they have all these like, you know, hexamers and other protein compounds and so forth. And they kind of, kind of like the Borg. <laughs> right, right. They, they kind of organize very nicely. Yeah. Um, and a lot of diseases kind of uh, proliferate like the Mandelbrot set. They just, they just right. form and then they become their own thing. So the, the one that we're working with right now, COVID-19, COVID-2019, um, that this disease, if you look at it, it's, it's, it's very geometric. Yeah. You know, I mean, even the little um, little antennas are perfect triangles. Yeah. Very, very. Um, and if you're familiar with the mono, like, if you're familiar with the monobrot set, if they did when they do the monobrot monobrot set with, um, like, cannabis, for instance, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> with cannabis or any other kind of flowers, um, and they do it over and over and over and over and over again, um, it it looks like if you look at the gray area of uh, the coronavirus disease 2019, mm -hmm. it looks like that. Oh, so, the inner part of it, then. The inner part of it. Oh. So it's just it's just amplification of man broad sets. So diseases, even diseases, follow sacred geometry patterns. So every well, that explains why some of the the sound healing stuff you hear about that. I got to be careful about what I say, but you hear about sound therapies that can affect things, and with cymatics, you can see why now. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're gonna get to cymatics. Okay. So a couple, a couple things about these images that I want to um, kind of read out. So this design of viral icosahedron is dis discussed further in the research at the Department of um, Chemistry and Biochemistry and Physics and Astronomy at the University of California in LA. So um, the, the research publication um, at the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, of the United States, what they said was, with very few exceptions, the shells or capsids of sphere-like viruses have the symmetry of an icosahedron and are composed of coat proteins. So although the synthesis of artificial protein cages is a rapidly developing area of science, the design criteria for self-assembled shells that can reproduce the remarkable properties of viral capsids, capsids are only beginning to be understood. So they're just beginning to understand viruses um, and how they organize. So they're learning that even viruses um, adhere to sacred geometry. So. And then the mm -hmm. other thing, yeah, the other thing is in ancient archaeology, many researchers, again, like I said, are finding the lion of the gates with the flower of life. And also in many ancient um, underwater and lost civilizations that they have no placement in history for, mm -hmm. they're finding um, sacred geometry as decorations mm -hmm. as well. So some sites are 15,000, 20,000, 30,000 years ago. They're sacred geometry decorating the, the sites. Wow. So and, we, and we've heard there's like 300 underwater cities just in the Mediterranean alone, I think they say. So a yeah. lot is underwater, and there's a lot to be explored. Yeah, and, and it's underwater because of the Ice Age, because of the, the water rising over the time. Yeah. So um, the Ice Age melts. So there's a lot of really good um, work that – the children of today and the near future can get into if they like scuba diving and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So anyways, next slide, um, the Sri Yantra. Okay, so we finally get to the Sri Yantra, which is the Hindu symbol from the um, very old, they say 7,000 to 13,000 years old, the Vedic, the Vedas 
of India, of Hinduism, mm -hmm. that text. Um, and the symbol, the sacred symbol is the Sri Yantra. And so um, some things to notate before I get into these pictures. So go ahead and study these pictures. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you some things to keep in mind about the Sri Yantra. So in, Kam in Kabbalah, that tradition calls the aura field your Merkaba. Okay, the aura mm -hmm. field. Yeah. Your secret geometry aura field, they call it your makaba. In Hindu, your makaba is called your Sri Yantra, which is the energetic vessel that an awakened person travels through different parallel realities in. So they say this Sri Yantra symbol is your makaba that you travel through. And in Buddhism, they call this your mandala. Different terms for the same thing. So this flow of energy that is depicted through the 64 intersecting points of the Sri Yantra is also represented in the 64 amino acids in DNA. Mm. Also, the I Ching, Chinese Book of Changes, also is made up of, what's the number? 64. 64! <laughs> 64 hexagrams and functions. And it functions much like DNA in the Sri Yantra. Um, the other thing also is the second um, command representing the 64 intersecting points in the Sri Yantra is seen in the three-dimensional pyramid structure represented in the sacred mountain, Mount Muru. So Mount Muru is believed to be a five peak mountain in the Himalayas that is believed by many Buddhists, Janus and Hindus to be the spiritual center of the universe on earth. So that's the picture on the right. Um, and the thing before I forget about that is you'll see a lot of pyramid structures in Buddhist arts and mandalas um, because like the scientist in the earlier um, slide has found in his research mathematically, the pyramid structure mathematically is sacred geometry. It falls in line with the sacred geometry of the human body as well. So at all sacred geometry in all forms that it comes into is the same math and proportions. Okay. So mm -hmm. all has 64 intersecting points because they all, each one of it has a consciousness and creates a mandala. So the math magician, math, math, mathematician and engineer Vladimir Sagmester studied the mathematical portions of the different intersecting points in the Sri Yantra. And he compared the exact points and mathematical distance between the intersecting points in the Sri Yantra to our solar system. And what he found that he published in his findings, um, a, addition to Sri Yantra and its mathematical pr properties, is what he found in studying the math of our solar system between planets and the sun and all that, is it's the same exact vortex math as sacred geometry. So in the universe is mm -hmm. organized based off sacred geometry. So everything is sacred geometry. So a couple of things now that you guys have gotten got familiar with the image here of the Sri Yantra is um, the first thing on the right, like I said, is this is a Buddhist mandala. And I hope by now you're starting to recognize the two halos in all of the Buddhas. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, and the Buddhas are at different levels because they're they're experiencing different parallel realities, higher, mm -hmm. lower, higher, lower, side, left to right, whatever. They're experiencing different parallel realities. And um, the more they raise the consciousness, the bigger they are. Um, and the other thing is, again, they're just having a splendid time in whatever, whatever reality that they're in. But um, what you see on the left is what I hope you've been studying. So the Sri Yantra is a symbol, a 2D symbol, just like the flower of life. But what they have done in, in a structure art is they've taken the Sri Yantra and they turn it into a 3D structure based on its intersecting points, its, its pyramids or its triangles, okay? Um, and 
where all those intersecting points in the flower of life, they created a triangle and they built it out. And when they built out the, the 2D Hindu Sri Yantra symbol, which is their sacred geometry symbol, it looks like this. Okay, so this is kind of the Merkaba that according to Buddhists and Hindus, everyone is. Now, the interesting thing is in this display, they shown light on this 3D structure. And at any point where the light shines through the 3D structure, it always creates that pattern on the ground. Flower of life. The flower of life. So a 3D pattern where you shine light through the intersecting points of a 3D Sri Yantra creates a 2D flower of life pattern shadow. It's the same thing. Yeah. I definitely see the, the Merkaba with extra shapes on top of it. So it's, it's the Merkaba with more added to it, more detail, I guess. Yeah. But it's the same exact points. There's only 64 points in this 3D Sri Yantra. Right. Okay, so let's move on to the next image. So um, here's a Sri Yantra's 2D symbol. Okay, this is the typical 2D symbol that people recognize as the Hindu Sri Yantra. Okay, mm -hmm. see the one in the middle inside of the um, the lotus flower. Yeah. Okay, um, that symbol that you see here. Yeah. Is the 2D version of this symbol that you see here. It's the same symbol. Okay. okay it's just built out. They just built it out. Um, and so what was interesting is that in sound research, scientists found that playing the um, um sound in a tonoscope or a sand plate, it formed the perfect Sri Yantra symbol. Wow. The sound of um, it creates the Sri Yantra symbol in science. Okay, so it signifies that the Sri Yantra, which is an ancient symbol um, linked to the Hindu Vedas, which could be as old as 13,000. I've heard almost 26,000 because of the, um, the cycles mm -hmm. um, of how they measure astronomy in the Vedas. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know quite how old, but it's very old. Um, but it shows that the Sri Yantra symbol is not a man-made design, but it's natural in nature. This is mm -hmm. a natural formation in nature. And it shows the evidence that there is a divine universal consciousness in all beings and physicality is designed based off sacred geometry. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, like, th th this is just, you, you can, you can, if you wanted to go ahead and find a tonoscope, play, um, have fun. You're going to get, <laughs> you're going to get this very intricate 64.2D version of the flower of life very cool. in your science experiment. <laughs> so the other thing that was very interesting about this research is that 432 hertz which is sound frequency of a human being. Okay, human beings, their frequency is 432 hertz. Mm. So 432 hertz and the OM chants converts into the Sri Yantra symbol. Mm. So every human being is 432 hertz frequency. And if you take the 432 hertz frequency and you also play it into semantics in a tonoscope, you get the same shape. Wow. Okay. So the thing is, is that um, OM is a cosmic bubble of sacred geometry and everyone is energy and they're the master of their own reality. Takes me back to in the beginning was the word, the vibration, right? Just play the sound. Yeah. Play the sound. Um, it, it, I didn't put this in this one because it's in another book, <clears throat> my other mandalas book. But um, all uh, music has its own frequency, and even the math of pi has its own song. It actually has notes that you can play for pi. Oh, wow. Yeah. The so pi has its own 
orchestra <laughs> for pi. <laughs> so even you can, you can think about creation through math. You can think about it through art. You can think about it through images. It, it's all going to translate to be the same thing for a, a human body. Translates yeah. to the frequency of 432 hertz. Translates to the Sri Yantra. Translates to fire life. I mean, there's so many different ways to see the same thing. Yeah. We're just we all just creating different versions of how we see the reality, the same reality, and appreciate the same reality. So, anyways, people are energy orbs. People yeah. are mandalas. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah, I hope you get into that point where you're seeing all the all the the connections. Yeah. So before I explain this image a little bit further, so researchers in semantics research found that by playing different frequencies in the form of hertz in a sand plate, it creates a sacred geometry pattern that looks like mandala. And the sound frequencies are measured in the form of hertz. So um, a German physicist, Heinrich Rudolf Hertz, discovered that in 1887 through radio waves, um, receivers in electromagnetic waves through his research. And in honor of his lifetime of work, a measurement of one cycle per second is revered as a hertz. So the Schumann resonance again is for Earth, um, for her changes in frequencies is also measure, measured in Hertz as well. So you might've heard Hertz in that way. But each cycle of Hertz are standing waves that are the flow of sine waves reflecting back at each other, which look like multiple lines of Vesica Pisces. Okay, so Hertz look like Vesica Pisces, even in radio waves. And then in, um, and then Brian Collins, which is another researcher, he wrote an article on the importance of 432 hertz in music. And he found that playing, again, 432 hertz um, to someone will harmonize the emotions of their body. So just listening to the sound of you at 432 hertz will harmonize your bipolarness, <laughs> will harmonize your body <laughs> because you're like, you're hearing your own heartbeat. Right. So it, it will help it will help calm yourself. And then the other thing also is further research that is done on the frequency of 432 hertz, um, as explored by um, the article Harmonic Mandalas from the Human Voice by John Stewart Reed and Eric Larson. John Stewart Reed, who is an acoustic scientist working in the UK laboratory, and Eric Larson, which is a U.S.-based design engineer, um, discovered that 432 hertz is the frequency of the human voice. Hmm. Okay, so our voice is 432 hertz. So this engineering duo developed a sophisticated cymoscope for semantics that can take anyone's voice and show the sacred geometric pattern unique to your voice DNA. Mm. Okay, and so the mandalas of each human being are unique to them, like a like a fingerprint, and it shows their complete energetic DNA blueprint in sound. So it's like um, it's like the genetic code in relation to sound. So both both men found that their research using a electronic cymoscope that everyone everyone vibrates at four hundred thirty two hertz. Everybody in, in, on Earth. Um, you want to make a human being play 432 hertz. You'll make Eve out of sand. Um, the sacred geometry mandala that is displayed in a cymoscope from the frequency emitted into the tonoscope um, from the voice of each person has slight differences which make them unique to one another. So there are no two people alike, even if they're identical twins, their voice signature is different. Just like the fingerprints will be different too. So what the cymoscope tool that was created to show what the sound of any frequency played at it looks like in three-dimensional terms is that sound does not travel like waves. So what they originally thought was sound and thoughts and words travel through waves, that's not true. What they really found is that sound travels in bubbles, like mandalas. So um, in the article, Harmonic Voice Mandalas by Cymoscope, um, the creators of that tool that they use in science and medicine and, and other things is that your voice is a holographic representation of all that you are. 
and it contains all aspects of your energetic field. So d despite what is taught in schools and colleges all around sound um, and that all the sounds around you travel to your ears as, as they travel as beautiful holographic bubbles, mm. not waves. So sound waves don't actually exist. The model is just a mathematical formula. What really exists is bubbles, like, like thought forms, like the right. things you say create a bubble. The things you think create a bubble. You are a bubble. So what they found, again, so if you look at this picture here, okay, you can go to that wonderful website. You can record your 432 hertz human voice, and they will send you what the tool says your voice DNA harmonic frequency looks like, and there are no two alike. And so it actually looks like a sphere and oh, when they wow. so you can do it for free uh i think it's a hundred dollars oh, okay. 100 150 dollars but um but there's actually a ten dollar um app that you can download from cymoscope and um you can see the m mandala for um music mm -hmm. for um you can you can kind of play with it you can see because everything's a mandala basically everything's right. an orb so um you and I have a holographic image. The world has a holographic image, but truly we're just all mandalas. Mm -hmm. We're just all energy orbs. And what they found is when they, when they took the image of the mandala and turned it into a 3D structure, and then they cut it in half, then you can see what you have on the bottom right there, which is your unique mandala. This is your unique Metatron's cube. Wow. Everybody has a unique sacred geometry structure to them. And as they evolve in their consciousness and energy, it will also evolve the pattern. Very okay. Cool. And the interesting thing also, if you go to that website, is there's a lot of couples that will get a couple's mandala. And when you look at the couples, a lot of the couples have been together for a very long time and they go and they get the voice mandala to see what they're you know, mandala looks like, yeah. um, they have very similar mandalas. So even in their voice DNA, they are very similar. It would be interesting energy. to like do, do like a couple when they first get married and then after like <laughs> 20 or 30 years, you know, yeah. some of these people, cause you know, couples will begin to look like each other and share oh, yeah. mannerisms and stuff. Cause they just, you know, they're around each other so much. So that'd be yeah. interesting to see how it affected everyone's individual uh, yeah unique it, uh design you know yeah it would be interesting to see how families yeah you know family clusters like what are all your mandalas for this family like you can almost take a look at a cluster of mandalas from a family or a couple um and kind of play you know pause and put it together and you can yeah. like line because they all start looking at like well this this is a family mandala this this mandala family looks like this this mandala family looks like that and you can actually see by just looking at the mandalas how intricate the mandalas are you can see how complex and how much energy they are is that the future do we have a future instead of going to all the mills <laughs> to have your your family photo taken you'll go and you'll just get everybody's orb you have an orb family picture this is what our orbs are can you yeah, guess this is my, too? yeah <laughs> this is my orb before the meditation retreat and this is my orb after the meditation <laughs> retreat i have evolved exactly. <laughs> i have more intricacy now right <laughs> i think my energy is much higher you know yeah <laughs> it'll be funny but um you know this is the future if you want to see yourself in a spiritual way yeah you know you can also see your energy level mm -hmm. based off of um, cymoscope research in your mandala so it, you can have one taken now and then check in on how you're evolving 10 years later and see what how your mandala has evolved right. have you changed have you grown you right. can see it also so even in science can't lie to yourself right so let's go on to the next one all right so remember that image in this many slides ago of um i think it was ezekiel Mm -hmm. where he was um, communicating with a teacher in a bubble right. in the sky. Okay. And then there's the wheel within the wheels. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, in, in Asia, 
and it's been going on for long time because most of buddhism is an offshoot of hinduism from the old 13,000 year old vedas mm-hmm. of hindu um which again they don't know the origin of the vedas because um it goes so far back but they speculate from the um buddhist folklores that they come from um the mythical land of lemuria mm-hmm. so anyways Here's beautiful Kuan Yin, the famous Fima Buddha. And there are other Fima Buddha teachers as well who have reached enlightenment. Um, but you can reach enlightenment and then you can come back if you want to. You can go back, you can come back, you know, you're infinite. You can go in the void, hang out for infinity, <laughs> come back for the ascension, you know, whatever, to help people do your bit, whatever. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's, up, it's all up however you want to play it. Um, but Kuan Yin always likes to come back and, um, help people and oftentimes if you look at the image um, she there's her halo around her head and there's her bubble that she's traveling in it's the bubble that she's traveling in yeah. that's her mandala okay now you, you see on the right is a zen buddhist monk who's meditating and the picture is a very sacred picture to zen buddhists and that philosophy, and it looks like a zero, but it's actually a nice round sphere. And um, in Zen Buddhism, that is what they call an enso. Okay, so my my um, e n s o. Um, so an enso is a spherical f- vessel that a master teacher travels in. Okay, so the image you see of Kuan Yin in her bubble, her very magnificent bubble, traveling different parallel realities, that would be an end so. Mm, And the image that you had in previous slides earlier of Ezekiel communicating with a master or a spiritual being from heaven in a bubble Mm -hmm. would be an end so. Okay. Okay, so that's your halo around your body. So a couple things about this. in Chinese cosmology, the universe itself is created out of primary chaos from material energy, organized into the cycles of yin and yang, and it's formed into objects and lives. So yin is receptive and yang is the active principle. So in short, um, remember that the yin yang symbol means the balance of opposites, which gives opportunity for new expressions or creations that rise out of dualistic forces of opposing energy. So yin and yang. Well, it's the yin and yang starting to look like people. (laughs) The Vesica Pisces. The Vesica Pisces all around us here. Yin and yang. It's like swirling around. It's like swirling around. You're in a bubble. You're in a Sri Yantra. You're in the Flower Life Orb. You're in a Merkaba. Whatever name you want to call it, you're in an Enzo. And there's like that uh, physicist who found that from studying the Sri Yantra and six geometry, there's a vortex inside you at the intersection, part of your heart. And Mm -hmm. if you look from the top down, and then there's this swirl of yin yang. It looks like the yin yang. Right. Okay. So we'll get into yin yang, all the same stuff. But so according to acupuncture massage cause, the yin yang symbol of dark and light opposing energies is used in traditional Chinese medicine as a model of diagnosing and treating illnesses. So the symbol first cropped up in the the Chinese Book of Changes, the I Ching, around 700 BCE. And then with regard to the I Ching, the ancient um, Book of Changes, it is too designed much like the Sri Yantra and the Flower of Life with its 64 markers, like the 64 intersecting points of the Sri Yantra and the Flower of Life symbols. So um, again, um, the Buddhist master teacher Nagarjuna, the founder of Mahamaka School of Mah- Mahayana Buddhism, which is um, popular in Tibet. Um, they often practice in Tibet and India. Is re- They revere um, the zero symbol. So, so in, um, in Indian numeric system, which is what we use for the numeric system, it's 
came from India, the zero, okay? Um, there's a spiritual element to the zero, okay? Um, and I mean, mathematics is just spiritual. So in Mahayana Buddhism in Tibet, they, re they say that whenever he is taught, the master often appears in a luminous circle in order to reveal the true form of Buddha nature. Okay, so you start getting really up in levels of consciousness and um, your teachers are probably not going to be in church. <laughs> 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 Sorry, people. <laughs> you're, you're on your own. <laughs> so <laughs> you're, you're at a level that like is probably not going to be able to organize anything um so but jesus told us we would do the things he did in greater and stuff so it's time for us to step into our roles as avatars step right? into yourself yeah. um step into yourself but anyways so like in the indian numeric system where zero is the beginning point like infinity the zero and infinity is the beginning point and then when you step out of it you take one step out and then you take two steps out and you go further into reality. So that's kind of like the spiritual nature of the, the, the number system. So, but it starts out with an Enzo. It starts out from the zero or the sphere that encapsulates your master teacher, which you are as well. That's interesting because that actually reminds me of, uh, you know, when I think it was the law of one um, that was talking about in the beginning you know, there was the first thought, the, the, the first initial circle, the zero point, right? And as it got to the edge of its existence, it created a new bubble. And then as it works around, that's the flower of life. That's why we see it that way, right? <laughs> yep, yep. Nothing's new underneath the sun. We're just rediscovering the same old. <laughs> <Yep. laughs> okay, so um, we're going to get through this. We're almost done with the slides, people. So, um, the, so now we get to the yin-yang symbol. Okay, the yin yang symbol. There is a beautiful yin yang symbol. So let's explain mm -hmm. the yin yang symbol. The yin yang symbol is a Taurus vortex. It's a vortex in science. They found uh, this out in science. I never noticed it. It's like a side view of a vortex, of a, uh, of a um, what do you call it, a toroidal field. It's like mm -hmm. you're seeing through yeah. the donut of it. So study this. I'm going to give you some scientific evidence behind this. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Randy Powell, he, he's a, he's a student mathematician, um, or was at one time, and now he's obviously, um, into his career, but he studied under Marco Rodin who was, and he was fascinated with the analytics of vortex math, you know, like there's a math in studying vortexes. And what Randy Powell did was take the vortex map and then he mapped it out, um, and he saw that he painted a picture through math of a torus vortex, which he called Abda or Abha torus vortex. And he found out that by carrying on with the math formula, it ended up creating a torus field or like a donut. He just kept on carrying out the math on paper. And the more he started doing the vortex math, the more wherever he would put the next answer, it was like he was making a jigsaw and he created a donut shape. All right, that was based off of the math. If you look closer into that donut shape, you'll see one and four and two and seven. That's the vortex math. And so he was just carrying out basic mathematic equations following the form, and it came up with this donut. Okay, so um, there's art in math. Um, the universe is very creative, find lots of different ways to represent itself. And so, um, so he goes over his calculations and his depictions in his presentation, Intro to Vortex Math, which he, I think he still does. Um, and in terms of the mathematic proportions of the Taurus Vortex, it has the golden ratio. It has the math of the Sri Yantra. It has the mathematics of all sacred geometry. Doesn't matter the form that you want to look into. It has it all. So the physicist, again, the quantum physicist, Nassim Haramim, he discovered that a toroidal field in any living being also has a double torus. So the description of a big torus vortex broken down is actually two smaller apple-shaped vortexes that has an access point connecting to the two apple-shaped toruses together in a scientific understanding of the same two circles that make up the Merkaba or mandala. 
So every person has a vortex inside them, according to science, that functions um, like and has the energy of a black hole. Okay, so much like a Mandelbrot set, sacred geometry is mirroring larger versions of itself and the interpretation that we we are smaller versions of the universal one mind and all reside inside the consciousness of the universal one mind, having our own individual experiences. Okay, so um, that's what Nassim found in his research. So let me explain this in basic. Um, so, like I said, uh, you know, like Nassim, when you study vortexes and black holes, which is what he does as a scientist, it creates two apple shapes. So, like, as you see in the field of the magnetic field of the heart and the magnetic field of the earth, it looks like an apple shape. So, what it is, is there's an apple shape on the, on the top half of your body. Connected in the middle is where the black hole is or where the vortex of your body is. And there's another apple shape on the bottom half of your body. And they kind of they kind of just kind of go around like each other like this. Okay, kind of like a two whirl whirlpools or or toil fields that go around like this. This is kind of how na how uh, vortexes and black holes work. Mm -hmm. Well, your body creates that is in terms of energy. And when you look again at the top view, this pattern is the yin yang symbol. It's the yin yang symbol, okay? And so when you look at this picture more in detail, so again, the, the heart creates this very high toil feel of energy, which is, if you look, if you remember the Buddhist mandalas, you have the huge aura around the body. That's your heart feel, okay? And then you also have a small one in your brain as well. Um, the earth is also built very much the same way, like everybody else with sacred geometry, so the earth has a magnetic field, mm -hmm. um, much like sacred geometry. And if you look at the bottom right there, um, you know, what they, what they do is if you take a look at the vortex map and all those intersecting points, let's say those are basically um, for, uh, Vesica Pisces, two intersecting circles, and you, you, you do it over and over again, and that's the pattern of the the torus vortex, the toroidal field that your body makes, it just inside of the apple shape, the um, the, the torus field or toroidal field of your body, inside of it is energy moving around, okay? And that mm -hmm. energy moving around looks much like this kind of a flower thing here. And if you take the intersection points of this flower donut and you just make the intersection points, you get a translation is the flower of life. Oh, wow. On the bottom right. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So everybody has a black hole inside them. That is what propelling you from one parallel reality to another. Everybody has a vortex. They are their own vortex. And they have their own magnetic field that makes a, a mandala. And if you look from the top view down of your energy field, you'll, it'll look much like a yin yang symbol in motion. Right. Okay. So yin yang symbol is sacred geometry. So you know what, what amazes me is that like the heart math Institute's research nowadays has shown that the toroidal field around the heart is way more powerful than the one around the mind. And, and, and we're looking at this artwork that's so old and it's showing the, the smaller circle around the mind and, and the bigger circle around the whole body is actually, you can see that the center of that is where the heart would be. So it's showing the energy field of the heart and the mind and it's showing the proportions that the heart is much bigger and encompasses the whole body, the, the, you know, the vessel that we're in. You right, know, you, right, you're gonna like this next slide. <laughs> okay, because okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna quiz everybody. I'm gonna quiz you, Shane. Can you see the Taurus vortex in this mandala? Oh, let's see. Let's see. What do you what you got? These are these are all different Buddhas. Buddhas is just a word for somebody who is awakened. Well, it looks like uh, well, it looks like the Taurus is sideways. But am I looking for one that's should be because it looks like I'm looking down on on a toroidal field on the top one, the bigger one, because it's almost like yeah, you're seeing it. Yeah, they're trying to make a complex structure. In it looks 2D 3D art. though, for sure. Yeah. yeah, it looks 3D because of the waviness of those. Yeah, 
So um, as you see in all these different um, teachers, you see everybody has two circles. Yeah. Two circles in the toroidal field. So remember, your brain creates its own mandala. It creates its own field, and right. it has two circles. In um, in the study of black holes and vortexes, it actually moves in two apple-like patterns on one on top of each other, mm -hmm. like two little apple-like, and then they just kind of swirl around. That's kind of mm. how the function of a of a vortex field looks like. But that's why there's in this 2D representation um, in Buddhist mandalas, they always put two circle rings around the vortex. So you I have see. one around your head, and then you have an even larger run around your body, mm -hmm. um, and the center is where the heart is. Yeah. The center of all mandalas are right where the heart is. It's right in front of us this whole time. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they even have the energy. They have the energy waves that come out. Just to kind of yeah. and the, just to kind of let you know it's energy. It's and radiating it's moving, out. Yeah. And it's radiating and it's moving in a pattern. Mm -hmm. So all of um, the classical teachers have the same mandala. That's right so in front cool. of us. And we're getting closer to the end. Oh, this is going to be a controversial one. Uh -oh. <laughs> the swastika, the swastika mm -hmm. in indigenous cultures. Sorry, now, wasn't this 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 was something that was hijacked? Kind of like the the whole, you know I got people that give me a hard time about the all thing item. Like I did, it was around a long time before the elite was. And here again, this was uh what Hitler did some research and kind of brought back this ancient symbol that was around way before him, right? Mm -hmm. The swastika, um, you know, a lot of Asians in Asian temples, like Hindu temples and John, Jonas temples and um, Buddhist temples really, really have a hard time with the West um, continuing to carry on the legacy of it being a representation of Nazism. Because it does not mean that in Asia, they still use it for what it was actually revered to all through their history. So um, swastikas is very interesting because a swastika is um, it is two intersecting patterns that look like a cross and they whirl and spin in a certain direction and they actually represent the vortex the torus mm. vortex like the yin yang symbol is another version of the spinning of your vortexes of your merkaba right um, if you look down from the top and you just pick up just the, the, the wave of it, it looks like a swastika turning around. Okay. It's just movement. Right. And um, so the swastika in Asia and in many indigenous cultures is an ancient symbol of abundance through awakening to the path of divine enlightenment within mm -hmm. oneself. And it's timeless. And the swastika still holds its meaning of good fortune mm -hmm. in many Asian religions and spiritual traditions. So in the Indian, it's an Indian word, Sanskrit word um, that's broken down into swa, S-W-A. That means higher self. And then asti, A-S-T-I, means being. And then ka, K-A, um, means self. So it is um, being with your higher self. That's the mean, the Sanskrit Indian meaning of the word swastika, is to be with your higher self, be awakened, be enlightened, move up the levels. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it's still revered and means in Asia. Um, and so according, again, being the higher self, the other thing also about the swastika history is that it shows up in the Indus Valley architecture or archeology span artifacts. And it's believed today as far back as 13,000 years ago to the last ice age melt or the mega flood. And the swastika is a symbol of Hinduism from the ancient Indian Vedic text that goes eight, you know, from 8,000 to 13,000 years ago is what they, they think it is, but they really don't know. It could be even older. Mm -hmm. And the Raj Veda in the four-part Vedas is believed to date as far back as, again, 7,000 years ago or longer. And the Indian astrology in the Veg Raj Veda suggests that the texts may go as far back as 26,000 years ago. Um, and the exact age, so as 26,000 is based on the, um, the cycles. 
of the solar system. Um, and they have that pretty darn precise in that text of how to count the processions of the solar system. And the exact age of the swastika is still unknown as much of the history of the Vedas is lost in oral tradition. Um, so again, if you want to understand that, if you, if you take the Vita Vyasa, which is about 3,100 years ago, into the four-part Sanskrit Vedic text that we have today, the Aryans were from India, and they were a civilization of enlightened beings, such as Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, and Siddhartha Buddha, or Siddhartha Gautama, which is the first Buddha, um, and he was a prince who denounced his title to going to um, be a monk in Buddhism. He was the founder of Buddhism. He came from an Aryan Indian royal family. So, um, so the swastika is actually like a, a hin a, originally a Hindu, but it's also used in um, in Buddhist and, and Janus traditions as well. So it just it's just another version of sacred geometry. It's another version of um, the yin yang symbol. It's just the, the swirl that your vortex makes in your Merkaba. So um, according to um, Bin Pin Shah, mm -hmm. in his article, swastika was used for Neolithic, Bronze and Iron Age cultures and its probably origins of astrology. What he found in studying it was um, the first known archeology span was the Mesin swastika. And the earliest swastika, again, was found in Ukraine in a car figurine that dates back to, to 12,000 years ago. Um, and again, one of the earliest known swastikas was a Neolithic culture in Southern Europe. But then another interesting thing that happened as well is that um, there are many uses for the symbol in pottery, but it also shows up 2600 BCE in the uh, Maji Ayo culture in China and 2700 BCE in the Minoan civilization. Um, the symbol again shows up in 5000 BCE in Mesopotamia. And then in the, um, in the modern Navajo Native American ceremony decors, they also use the swastika. And they have been using it for as long as they can remember in their spiritual ceremonies as well. So it, it's interesting that even Native American Navajos and even the Mayan Indians use the swastika as decoration in some of their ceremonies as well, uh, if you go farther back. So it, it shows that there is some link between these indigenous cultures in the Americas and these indigenous cultures in the other parts of the world, like Asia and you know the Fertile Crescent, and they go way back. Do you know anything about the? Because uh, I'm noticing at the the bottom image, the third one, over where it's got uh, two different emblems. They're both going opposite directions, though. And then I'm noticing up on the temple right above that, it's going to the left, which appears to be the opposite of the way the Germans did it. So uh, the yeah. reason I ask is because Alva's bringing up that the Germans had switched it to go the other direction. Mm -hmm. You can use in so in Buddhism, you can turn it one way, you can turn it the other way. It's just another. It, they both mean um, good fortune. Mm -hmm. It's just another way of seeing good fortune. Okay. So I'm not exactly sure what the exact terminology, but it's both positive symbols, and you can turn it either way. But once again, it's uh, you can see it's naturally occurring there because it looks like they used is that cymatics to create the emblem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. So yeah, crazy. if you look at the image, so if. Oh, another thing that's interesting about the swastika too is um, in 2007, archaeologists in Kazakhstan found using Google Earth that they discovered 260 geoglyphs. One of them was a swastika that dated back to 8,000 years ago. Um, so it's before the, the Nazca lines in Peru. Wow. Okay. And so they're 250 meters wide and NASA was able to find them. And so now that they're, they're looking at how old are these symbols in the earth, they're, they're larger than the Nazca lines in, in uh, Kazakhstan. So, um, and then of course the other thing also is um, 
for Native American tribes. I'll go through all the pictures in just a minute. For Native American tribes, the swastika, um, they, they don't call it the swastika, they call it whirling logs, like whirling logs. Um, they call it whirling logs. And it's, it's a, again, same meaning, it's abundance, prosperity, good luck. And um, it is a broken cross symbol, which to Native Americans represent the sun and the four directions and the four seasons. And according to Navajo stand paintings, the rotation cross is often depicted in the artwork um, as a marker of the energy of Yi, Y-E-I. So Yi spirits are deities in, in many Native American traditions and they we resemble highly evolved beings that come to teach them different lessons about life and how to live harmoniously. Okay, does this all sound familiar? You know, there's this like master teacher with all this information and knowledge is coming through a whirling log, there's some kind of like Merkaba coming <laughs> yeah. down. I wanna teach you about farming and then get out of your life because you bug me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel sometimes. You guys just started to bug me. <laughs> so, anyways, the Yi symbol it, um, is in for Navajo tribeswomen and and historian Melissa Cody. She wrote a lot about this, and it's a special kind of deity. And again, it's revered as a talking god, someone who speaks directly to humans and how to live harmoniously, harmoniously in and live amongst the earth in peace. So ye deities often provide some simple rules of behavior to conserve and only to use the things that you need to survive. So don't pilgrims the earth for greedy needs. Um, so, you know, that those are the messages of the ye um, mm -hmm. spirits. And they're also known as grandparent spirits like rainbow Coco Pelli, uh, which is a deity that commands the rainbows and gives beauty to all those in harmony. So, um, so you know, what the Yi symbol, which is a swastika or whirling log, is what they call it in Native American traditions. Um, they go all the way back to, I don't know, we don't really know how old Native Americans really are, but archaeologists believe that um, the information that we know came from the mound builders. Um, so the mound builders were estimated to be about 3500 BCE in the Great Lakes area of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And um, the mound bu builders had, again, pyramidal type of structures. They had sacred geometry in, um, in their decorations. And so we don't know a lot about it, but the point is, is that this symbol is a very revered, precious symbol in Native American, Mayan, Asian um, spiritual traditions. It's not a Nazi symbol. And so um, in Asia, when they were gonna have the Olympics in Japan, they were having a really hard time with Westerners going, you have to hide all of your swastika symbols all over your country. And they're like, how do we put a band-aid on all of our temples and all of our buildings and at our airports and everywhere? Because it's everywhere. It's like the right. peace symbol is everywhere. How do you, you know? So there, so there, there was a big thing, like people need to educate themselves and, and just let go of that horrible tradition of the Nazis because they don't own that symbol. It's old. Right. So, um, so that's the history behind the swastika. So let's go over these pictures really quick. So there is Chief William Neptune um, of, of his tribe, and he's, he adorns the, the symbol in ceremony. Um, you have the Hindu symbol, the Hindu temple and the Buddhist temple above there. Um, this is the Indus Valley um, seals from, they estimate about 13,000 years ago that they found that had the, the swastika. Um, you know, you have Northern Iran, they found that from about 30, 3,200 years ago. And that's a, a necklace that has swastikas that some royal um, had. And then um, on the far right, okay, the swastika symbol is actually created in nature in what they call Faraday waves, okay? So what are Faraday waves and why does nature create a swastika symbol naturally? So basically, Michael Faraday, he discovered that there are nonlinear standing waves that appear as liquids enclosed in a vibrational rep receptacle. So when the vibration frequency exceeds a critical value, the surface becomes unstable. Okay. And then 
when he found that fine tuning the vibration of frequency and accelerating it does create diverse sets of symmetrical patterns. It starts creating these patterns in nature. And the other thing is it's natural in nature because alligators make these kind of like vibration patterns as mating calls and they send these symbols on the water to other alligators to find mates. No way. Yeah. That's so alligators are sending swastikas from <laughs> on the water doing whatever alligator sounds they make. They're making the alligator <laughs> sounds. And it's sending these waves, these symbols in waves. And another alligator might go, I like the O. And, and go, oh, I like you. Another <laughs> alligator might go, ooh, I really like the radio wave symbols. You sound interesting. I go to you. You know, right. and another one might say, I like the three bars. That's that's mine. That's my guy, you know. Right. So alligators make these patterns on um, on the water to call their mates. Okay. This you, is their, you know, it's interesting because technically that's what we're doing when we talk and we're, we're sending out invisible waves, sound waves, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's really not much different. It's just that we're able to see it on the water surface a lot yep. easier, I guess. We're, we're sending out our own voodoo, our own, right. you know, vibe, yeah. you know. I like totally. the energy of that guy. <laughs> like, I like her energy. <laughs> right. Know? Same exact thing. You know, it's this is, Faraday waves are like, in the animal kingdom, um, their pickup line. <laughs> <laughs> right. So swastikas are natures are, are, are natural in nature. They are not man-made creations. So Hitler did not come up with it. Um, okay, next. And we're almost we're almost to the finish line, people. Mm-hmm. It's gonna all come together if it hasn't already. Meditation changes um, reality. So meditation and gamma. And I've talked about this before. And basically, this is what they found. Is as you study that, you, you'll understand it as well. So, in the journal, in the Journal of Conflict Resolution, published by the International Peace Project in the Middle East, the effects of the Maharishi technology of the unified field um, in 1988. What they found that in a 1968 study of the Maharashi, Maharishi effect, which is the yogi that lectured um, with Buckminster Fuller in many of the earlier slides. So what they found is that when people meditate um, and they and and they meditated at high frequency together on a certain outcome, what they found in over 60 studies doing this meditation over and over again um, in different areas like DC and other places, what they found is that the crime rate stopped active wars stopped during that time frame and what they found is that the mathematical formula that came from such experiments showed that one percent of any population all over the world is all that is needed to create the energy of positive loving change in our holographic physical reality so you know after 60 studies they decided to do it again um so john Haglin who talked about transcendental meditation, he did it again in DC. Um, and because DC is very crime ridden. And in the summer months, su- summer months when it's really um, hot is when the crime rates go up. And so they, they did it with 4,000 participants. Um, and at the end, you know, they, and they did it with the University of Texas, um, Temple University, University of Maryland, um, all, all these federal agencies, that, all these participants that came through. So out of 4,000 participants meditating at the same time, focusing on you know, positivity um, and a positive outcome for the city, there was a, um, they predicted a 20% drop in crime and what they actually achieved was a 25% drop in crime at the time, okay? Wow. And what they found that is that days when the numbers of meditators were the largest, the levels of conflict reduced by about 80% overall. And I actually tried this. There was a worldwide meditation, I think a couple of weeks ago. Um, In the fourth. For, fourth yeah, fourth. for the COVID, for the COVID pandemic. The very next day, the numbers change. The numbers change of how of we've meet the peak and we're coming down and you know we're gonna get down and you know it's, it's gonna accelerate. The very next day, the numbers the numbers changed that night, but mm-hmm. it wasn't reported until the very next day on the news after the worldwide meditation. 
So, you know, you can do this, you search over and over again, it always is the same thing. What's happening and what they found in meditation research is that 99% of the world's population is going to respond to 1% of the high frequency individuals. Okay, that 1% are the dreamers. They are the ones shaping reality. Everyone else, sorry, not to sound kind of, kind of mean, it's just shameful. <laughs> sorry, but you know, you can get there too. But that's all it takes, 1%. So Earth only really needs 1% of humanity to get into the fifth dimension. And then everybody else at whatever level you're at is going to get pulled by the storm. So, right. you know, that's going to be kind of like people. a big ship and, and, and you have a small group of rudder, so to speak. That's sort of guiding the whole thing. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and again, they're just focusing on just connecting to universal one mind and connecting to the universe, just kind of focusing on positive things. And so the other thing that they noticed, too, when they were studying, because um, they studied many, many thousands over 60, 70, you know, hundreds of meditation research. They always find the same numbers, the same thing, um, is that many people get into like um, alpha, which is a, a certain level of frequency and in alpha you um can reset your own program you can reset your dna you can re you can start making goals you can change like i don't want to smoke or whatever or i don't want to i want to start working out you can change your own programming in alpha in meditation some people got into the highest frequency which they found out that there was another frequency um in the brain another brain wave which they call gamma and they found that out in the 80s but what they found is very few normal people who do meditation get to gamma. But when they start to, there was a surge in the, about 20 years ago when I got into this research, when I was following a lot of Buddhist monks going into this research, offering themselves to get meditation and consciousness and mindfulness into the fold. What they found in all of these Buddhist um, and Christian and different monks of different religions, many of them were Buddhist, um, what they found in putting an EEG test or thing on their head and then having them do the meditation is that monks and nuns typically, for the most part, get into gamma. They get into gamma and, um, and they stay into gamma for a very long time. So on the image on the right, you have different types of um, meditation practices and in Vipassani, which is a, a type of meditation that you could do, many people get into alpha and their brain range is 7 to 11 hertz. But in gamma, on all of these different types of meditation, and there's so many different types of meditation, it doesn't really matter. But when you get into gamma meditation, your brain wave frequency is 60 to 110 hertz. So whenever, like, let's take an example of, um, of the Schumann resonance. When the earth goes into these high hertz gamma frequencies, if you're not at that level, it's going to suck for you. <laughs> okay. Right. So meditate, do art, listen to music, go for a walk, you know, just get into your groove and stuff because it's going to be much more easy for you and much more pleasant riding through the storm and riding through the process of getting into a higher dimension with earth. If you're living in gamma, if you're living in a meditative state, if you have that higher frequency vibe all the time or try to most of the time. Otherwise you can be pulled by the storm and, and just struggle the whole time you're getting yanked by the storm. So you can, you can ride it how you want to. And there's again, no right or wrong way to travel between different parallel realities. It's just, what do you want to do next? So this is what they found in meditation is that when you're in gamma frequency, you have very high um, visualization. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're seeing images more vividly. You have more lucid dreams. Everything is much more vivid, much more crisp. You have a clearer picture quality in mm -hmm. your brain. And because we're all consciousness and we're all energy orbs, you are creating a more crisp, higher version reality. Mm. Okay, so it's really important mm. to get into gamma. So you want to change the world? Meditate, get into gamma, radiate at a higher frequency, work on your level of consciousness. That is going to change the world more than anything.
And we even talked about, it, I think, the last time you were on now, uh, with the energies being so high, we can actually achieve these higher levels much easier without all of the years and years of meditating because now it's like you're just going with the flow rather than trying to go against, you know, whatever the planetary frequency is. Now that the yeah. frequency of the planet's raising, we can just ride that, right? Yeah, just ride the wave. Just ride the yeah. wave. Just ride the wave. <laughs> ride the um, wave. Yeah, we go to the next one. We're almost there, people. So there isn't very many tools that we have now to measure the, the, the energy level of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the earlier slide, I showed the um, the semantics where you can go and get your um, your voice mandala, your mandala printed out. Mm -hmm. You can see your your mandala, but that just see what it is. But you don't know what level that it is. So um, not that it really matters too much. But the only thing that we have so far to date um, that I know of in twenty years of research is kinesiology, and Dr. Um, David R. Hawkins a very top mental health professional. He spent his whole life on um, mental health and understanding consciousness. And he used kinesiology to measure and create the map of consciousness. Okay. And very fascinating guy. And um, his map of consciousness is, was, was so spot on against the science of um, different things that it just, it just continues to be the only thing that we have so far to measure the energy level of um, different teachers. So you want to know what your bishop radiates at? Measure the, the energy. Not so good? Find another church. <laughs> 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 you want to know what um, this doctor measures at? You know, do the kinesiology test. Not so integrous? Find Get a second opinion. You want to know what this politician measures at before you vote? Less of two evils, find the one that's going to be at a higher frequency than the other. You know, I mean, you can just use, and, and he did this his whole life where he did thousands of calibrations on different things just to see. And the things that are really no notable that he found, uh, he was so good at doing this. Um, it, so, so many Buddhist monasteries would consult with Dr. Hawkins to measure the energy field of Tolkien children, um, such as the Kamapa, which is the predecessor of um, the Dalai Lama. He's retiring, and the Kamapa is the, the person who's stepping in into his shoes to work with academia and continue the work of consciousness research in academia. So no more. So, um, but, you know, when he was alive, he measured the Kamapa's energy to be very, very high. Um, and, you know, what, what happens is monks would, in, in Buddhism, they would do uh, meditation and get into the gamma frequency, mm -hmm. and they would try to geolocate um, the reincarnation of a former high frequency spiritual monk. Okay, so um, some notable toku monks of the past was Yeshua, or in the West, you would call Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's different than the West because the West doesn't quite understand energy of people and consciousness level. Um, everything's, you know, very surface level. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in Buddhism, they, they understand because they have been looking at the end souls and the teachers of, you know, of different levels based on their energy and their Merkaba strength and, and how large it is. They've been seeing through with the third eye and, you know, through meditation. And, um, <clears throat> they don't do any kind of democratic voting. Like you, you can try to be the next Dalai Lama and do all the polit politics you want to, but you're not going to get the vote. The person who's going to get appointed is the person that they measure that has the highest level of energy and consciousness, the highest vibrating individual that they can geolocate based on their meditation. And when Dr. Hawkins came about with Map of Consciousness and his research, um, they used um, his method and had him measure to make sure that the people that they geolocated as their uh, spiritual teachers was of good calibration. So um, that's an interesting thing about Dr. Hawkins' work and um, 
calibrating people. So like the Dalai Lama had to be calibrated, Karmapa had to be calibrated, everybody has to be calibrated. So <laughs> you just aren't good enough. We're gonna find somebody that's higher residence. Sorry. <laughs> still a student, still a student. <laughs> so, yeah. so um and you know it, it's very interesting. It's a different way of living. Um but that's how they have created like the Tibetan um monastery has been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years that's how they have let, kept these monasteries functioning um for so for thousands of years is because mm -hmm. they've brought on leadership that have high energy so the other thing that's, that's notate that you want to notate about dr hawkins work is that in order to have accurate results two people who conduct the kinesiology test must radiate at 200 level of energy or above so they must have integrity and only 15 to 20 percent of the world's population currently reside at that level according to dr hawkins when he was alive and it probably hasn't changed that much so kind of the 80 20 rule um and the other other thing that he found is that locations like cities and counties and states and countries, they all have unique frequencies. So just like humans are 432 hertz, that's unique to a human. Like a monkey's not going to be 432 hertz, and a you know a frog's not going to be 432 hertz, but a human will. Mm -hmm. Locations also have its own frequency. So it it can be explored that locations. Um, remember those vortexes in the different access points of the ley lines on the earth? Right. Those have unique signatures and they have unique frequencies. So um, it's something to be investigated. And this is what, what he found in his lifetime of research is that locations have frequencies that are unique to them. And they function much like longitude and lat latitude. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're interested in vortex um, science, and working with Earth's ley lines and access points to maybe try to find some way to travel between vortexes, it's speculated, but according to the map of consciousness, it is real. According to ley line and dowsing and that science, they exist. We just don't know how to turn it into material things. It would, it would probably get rid of the travel industry. <laughs> so... <laughs> so um, well, that's exactly how some of these higher level beings ships work. They have, since every location and not only three dimensional space, but also time, all four dimensions have a frequency. They can just move from one spot to the other just by changing the resonance of their ship. And it's yep. like instantly yep. there. Yeah. And that's the same concept too. When you look at the map of consciousness, I mean, he's barely touching on it. The, the work is wonderful, but he's, I mean, the work is so wonderful that Buddhist monasteries use him to, to find the next Karmapa, to find the next Dalai Lama. That's, right. that's a pretty big reference. That's well, they actually say credit. that they use technology to do this, but we actually have this ability with our Merkaba to, to, to do this. They just yeah. use technology to make it easier, but we all have this ability. We just don't know how to access it, I guess. Yeah, so when you raise your frequency and or you lower your frequency based on your perspective on things and, and, and your your inner work, you're changing your frequency, and when you change your frequency, that black hole inside you is popping you into a new reality. Mm. Okay? But once you understand it, it's going to be, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So, um, again, we're down to awakening and ascension. So what do you want to manifest next? It really comes down to this. There's really no right or wrong way to jump between realities. You may jump into a reality that sucks. You may jump into a reality that's pretty good. You, you know, whatever. It, it's all a journey. You're infinite. So, I mean, the definition of a Buddha is one who is awakened. Somebody who realizes that they exist in a holographic reality and they're, they're responding to the commands of his user. And again, ascension, like I've always said, is raising your energetic frequency by living the best version of you. And as a result, you positively affect yourself and those around you and your inner bliss manifests a parallel reality that matches you. So, you know, I, I have outcomes for how I want to experience certain events and it may not be agreeable to other people. And that's fine. I don't really care. You experience your reality. I'll experience my reality. Mm -hmm. But because um, there's no right or wrong way to experience reality. It's just like there's no right or wrong way to get to um, to work. 
but everybody will have a different experience based on mm. how they want to travel. And that's the same thing. I will use my macabre to travel between realities a certain way. And if it doesn't agree with you, that's totally fine. I will go my way and you go your way. Safe journeys. So each time you change your perspective on a subject of any kind, you're likely going to experience a slight variation in your reality, which is a sign of traveling between parallel realities and parallel people and parallel events. Okay, very important because right now we're going through COVID 2019 and there are parallel outcomes. And there are parallel, I have come across parallel people during this event. Mm -hmm. and, par and we are, I mean, Jane Goodall is a great example that everybody can relate to. So your outcome for how you experience this event is probably going to be different for how somebody else's outcome. So we don't have to all agree on things because we're going to have the experience we want to have um, based on our decisions. So I just like a smooth ride. Um, oh, yeah. I don't like a jumpy roller coaster, but some people like that. They like it like they like to be tossed around and banged <laughs> around and barely survive. <laughs> You're my wild story. Oh, my goodness. You know, some people like that, and that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. I just, you know, that gives me vertical. So, <laughs> so um, again, being a conscious creator requires inner work and an external reality um, are agreed to reflections of what's inside. So um, all that inner work is so boring. The spiritual life is actually quite boring. Um, but, you know, paying your bills on time, going to work so you can, you know, maintain your sustenance for yourself and your family, uh, working on your inner self, um, you know, all these kind of things, you know, they seem really boring, but you living at a higher frequency and being part of that 1% is actually helping the world better than the world knows. And it's yeah. been proven in science. Absolutely. So, yeah, so um, here's my picture of one of the Buddhist monasteries in Laos, where I am originally from. Um, this is um, the Ban Hatse Khon Vat Buddhist temple my mother helps fund the renovation of. And you'll probably see some after you see this presentation, if you watch the whole presentation, there's the dragons, they're mythical 5D. Um, I do find quite interesting that there's quite a bit of people who are saying that they see small little dragons around. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, but the, if you see the lion holding the ball, right? there is the line of the gates at the gates holding the flower of life ball. Right. So, um, so, you know, we have a lot of the sacred geometry all around and, um, you know, again, I, I've known this through studying art history and um, Buddhism and mysticism through my childhood upbringing of Buddhism, but I've had to wait 20 years to gather all the scientific information to show that all these sacred symbols in all of these traditions are the same thing. And it comes down to your energy. You are all traveling in your own Merkaba and your level of consciousness and your level of energy is going to parallel and send you to a reality that matches you. So travel safely and enjoy the ride. <laughs> coming from the galactic uh, travel agent. <laughs> yeah, coming from the galactic travel agent. Uh, yeah. So a final message. I want to do a final message because I think this is the longest uh, presentation, but it's worth it if you wanted to deep dive into the sacred geometry in like three hours instead of spending so many years trying to learn it yeah, um, a great teaser for the book that's coming out oh yeah yeah and then you, if you want to get more into the science you can read all 400 pages <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll geek you out but um the final message i always get um because i do qhht sessions and i am doing it now um with my beautiful seahawks mask um is from each all the oversoul, the oversouls that come through in each session, they always say the same thing and I compose it into this message that I want to leave your viewers with, um, which is, you've always been enough. Use the gifts and the resources all around you to create the life you want to experience, a life full of joy and love. And the spirit world will nudge you through synchronicity. You can do it. 
Absolutely. That's a great message. And, you know, 20 years, but you can see how it all lined up for this perfect time of now when we really need to begin to understand how the energies work and all of this. So, yeah, excellent. Well, you know, I mean, I want to say also with with the, um, you know, my my husband's grandmother told me about her going through the polio epidemic in the early 1900s and going through the Spanish flu with her mother. And, um, you know, the way I see it is that I have front row tickets with my popcorn and my mask to the greatest freak show on earth. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to enjoy the freak show and see what happens. <laughs> so, so I Absolutely. I I've been telling people, take snap some shots because this is like history in the making. You know? I You're mean, watching. Gonna... Yeah. You're watching a pandemic during the age of the internet. Well, that's going to be interesting. (laughs) Right. It's like we don't realize how cool it is that we're alive at this time. And it's easy to get focused on the negative stuff and to miss all the exciting things. People are waking up. This is a huge catalyst for people. So it's easy to focus on the negative. But people are waking up. People finally have time to get on and watch a video and learn about some stuff. So it's working out to the good. Yeah. I think it's – I think – I, I heard something somebody said. I really agreed with it. It's like Earth's put they they put us all in time out, and everybody's been sent to their room to think <laughs> about things. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> you go stay in your room, and you think about it. <laughs> okay. And it's so funny because I, a lot of the people in our community have been in their room. They they haven't wanted to come out. And now they're like, oh, everybody's in their room. I think I'll come out and look around while everybody's home. Right, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so it's been funny. So we'll get through this. We'll get through this. Um, get through this. And the next time something impactful, like worldwide, I mean, we're going through it as a world. I mean, talk about unity consciousness. And I mean, this is pushing people in no, in new ways that they've never done before. Right. You know, it's challenging like force, people. it's yeah. challenging people. Yeah. I mean, it's a you're being pulled by the storm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, I wish if you can't come on, I'd love to have you back when the book gets released. Like even if it's within the five days, we're going to have a big, uh, you know, book release party or something. And that will give uh, the viewers an opportunity to go nab it up in the first five days or whatever. Or you can just let me know when it's out and I can put a, a post out so people know that go grab it or that it's yeah. available now. Yeah, no I, rush. I, Divine timing, you know. That. Yeah, <laughs> I will. Um, I will definitely send it to you guys um, during the five-day promo, so everybody can download it for free and, and read it. And I always, um, again, promote it on Facebook. And um, I'm really delighted to see which countries get the most downloads and are um, are reading through it. So it would be interesting to see what the world, how the world responds to a free book on exploring parallel realities using sacred geometry. Right. Um, so yeah, when I release my book, um, um, what is it? What's my book? Ah, I wrote so many books. <laughs> yes, <laughs> when I release my book, <laughs> <laughs> Buddhist Guide to Parallel Realities Using the Four Noble Truths and Eightfold Paths, I sent it out around the world, boosted it on Facebook, and it got downloaded by like 50,000 people. Uh, 50 to 70,000 people. So, you know, it went around. I don't really care. If the information helps, it helps, and that's good. Right. So, and then I fall back into behind the curtain and carry on with my life. <laughs> but, of course, you're a QHHT practitioner, so anybody in the Seattle, Washington area can look you up for And you'll wear a mask. Yeah, so, yeah. No worries there. <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely I would be happy to come back again. Um, and, you know, we can talk about whatever the uh, – universe wants us to talk about at that time perfect well excellent so i want to thank you guys for sticking around with us i can't believe it most people have been here uh most of the time and we're right oh, really how many people are in the hours. how many we, people were in there we got 39 right now but it's oh, been fluctuating those... 40 to 50 to 60 something like that i think for for sticking around for a three-hour presentation of sacred geometry i mean that's You're that's right. commitment that's commitment to self you that's just a great group we got here yeah, they get it you know yeah, you just committed to yourself like bit, big time. I mean, you just saved yourself a lot of Sunday meetings. Yeah, definitely. So. Well, we do have Vaughn's uh, links below to go get her book, to go to her website, to schedule a BQA, or I'm sorry, QHHT. Sorry, I'm used to BQA. Yeah. And uh, there was another link uh, to get your books. Uh, and I, let's see, your website, actually, the Markable 
Chakra's website actually has links to everything else too. So mm -hmm. if you don't have a way to write it down or you might forget about it, just go to MerkabaChakras.com and that will link you to her YouTube and everything else. Somebody else was asking about your YouTube link earlier and it is in the description box below so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i didn't notice it until later well we'll definitely have von back here in a month or two uh when you got your book coming out and when things we'll see how things are going here a lot yeah. is happening right now it's an exciting time so thank you so much von for you're welcome here. bye lots everybody. of love and light you guys we'll see you on the next one Be sure to check out the website at UOTF.net. There you will find the live stream schedule displayed in your local time right there on the front page. Below that you'll find links to take the Beyond Quantum Healing course at a discounted rate, purchase our book Mandela Effect Friend or Foe in paperback or ebook, or to contact me to schedule a BQH session. At the top of the site you'll find links to help support the work I do. Access the free private forum where you can discuss organizing get-togethers in your area, Mandela effects, and more. Thank you all so much for being here.